Connecting Baltics through sport. The eighth edition of the Nord Stream race is set for a glorious start in Kiel. Only the best teams from the national sailing leagues of Germany, Denmark, Sweden, Finland and Russia have qualified. Welcome to Kiel, a city rich in maritime history, with its impressive naval base and, of course, Kiel Week itself. Are you ready to race a thousand nautical miles across the Baltic Sea? Good morning and welcome from sunny Kiel in North Germany. My name's Andy Rice and with me is our resident expert, Suzanne Salmanen. And Suzanne, this never happens at Kiel Week, does it? 138th edition, first time the sun's ever come out in Kiel. Yeah, true. We're normally having our umbrellas out the whole time, but Kiel Week has really shown it off this year with a lot of sun. And I think the whole week shows a lot of sun in the broadcast as well. Yeah, so uh, fingers crossed that keeps on going. Um, now, there are thousands of sailors here, hundreds of boats competing, but we are specifically looking at five boats in this regatta. Today is the welcome race. We have about 300 boats about to start the welcome race from Central Kiel, from the Kieler Yacht Club, and then racing out to sea. We'll talk through the course um, a little bit later on. Um, but within that fleet is the Nord Stream race fleet. Now, we are going to be talking about these five Club Swan 50s, each representing one nation, one Baltic nation. So we're starting here in Germany, then we go to your home nation, uh, to Copenhagen, Denmark, yeah. then we go to Stockholm, Sweden, um, and then on to Helsinki, uh, Finland, and then the final in St. Petersburg, Russia. Um, so this is the start of a thousand mile uh, race through the Baltic called the Nord Stream Race, and the welcome race Yes, it's a bigger race for these 300 boats that have come from all across Europe and maybe other parts of the world. Um, but this is also the, the bit that we're really interested in is who's going to win out of th those five boats today. Yeah, so the Nord Stream race will have its first inshore race here at this welcome race. And today in total, they will have three inshore races. So they will take part a little bit of the welcome uh, race. And then afterwards, they will be uh, having their own two inshore races to, yeah, because for the Nord Stream race, it is inshore races and offshore races that will combine the overall result in the end. So, yeah, for us, that is uh, the exciting thing to follow. That's the Nord Stream race today, these five Club 150s. Uh, yeah, and, and they will be in the first start. Okay, so they're going to be in the first start. So I, th I think there's something like five starts. So there's, mm -hmm. there's four other starts taking place behind the one that we're going to be following. But, but our cameras are going to be following the action between these five clubs, 150s. Now, there's not an awful lot of wind, uh, but we've got every uh, nation's flag next to us, just uh, to the side of our commentary position here at the Olympia Zentrum, the, the place where the Olympic regatta took place at the, uh, the Munich Games in 1972. Um, so we're, we're in a purpose-built um, sailing centre here. This is the centre of sailing in Germany, really, isn't it? This is, this, this is where a lot of the great sailors come from in Germany. So uh, we're, we're, we're going to see a lot of local German support for the German team in the Nord Stream race. Definitely. That's Norddeutsche Regatta Verein. Yes. Uh, they've competed in this race before. Um, but also uh, there's going to be a lot of support throughout this race for the other four nations, for Denmark, Sweden, Finland, and of course the Russians who won the race overall last year as well. And I think you're totally right. The, the, Kiel, the Kiel of Woche, the Kiel Week, is, a, is one of the biggest sailing events we have here in the north of Europe. I actually think it's the biggest in northern Europe. and it's. Uh, I think it's the biggest in the world. I, you I think don't, so? Yeah, well, <laughs> in, in terms of, it, it depends how you measure these things. Yes. But if you put all the boats end to end and measure the length of all the boats, if you put them end to end, I think Kiel Week would win. In terms of number of sailors that take part, I think Kiel Week would win. Yes. Um, it's also been going a long time, since 1882. So um, it is quite a tradition. And I think it's also a very respected event by a lot of sailors and a very broad amount of sailors. We have everything from the youth sailors to the Olympic sailors. We have offshore racers being here and it's really, really a great sailing party and uh, yeah, I, th 
I think every sailor who's been here loves tequila vodka. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. They, they love it when the sun comes out yeah, because, as, as we said earlier, that doesn't always happen. I just <laughs> feel so blessed to be coming here this year and to be able to present you with uh, blue skies and fluffy, fluffy white clouds. But we are here, you and me, at the Kila... Oh, we have some background info here. Um, we are in the in the Kila Woche, like where the sailing takes part, um, where you said at the Olympic uh, sailing area. But these pictures we see here are actually from the middle of town, where we will have our start. Okay, yeah. So, so where you're watching now is is about uh, it's about ten miles away, a little yes. bit less for, from our commentary position. So we will be actually seeing the boats from our commentary position as they come into the final half or, or third of the race towards the, the big lighthouse, which will be the finish. And we'll, we'll talk about a, a little bit more about that later. Just to fill you in a bit more about what is the Nord Stream race, the, the overall concept of this race, let's have a look at a review of the 2018 edition. Yes. Nord Stream Race, a 1,000 nautical mile offshore race through the Baltic Sea, from Germany to Russia. The Nord Stream Race is the ultimate offshore challenge for teamwork, performance, endurance and passion. Every crew has the same equipment and tools. Only skill and teamwork make the difference in performance and finally winning the Nord Stream race. To qualify for the Nord Stream race, first each team has to win their National Sailing League. In 2018, the Russian team from Lord of the Sail Asia were unstoppable and demonstrated their extensive skills in offshore sailing. The Nord Stream race passes through five great cities, Kiel, Copenhagen, Stockholm, Helsinki, St. Petersburg. The long distance race connect five unique cultures. 100 sailors from five nations are battling for the trophy and the title Best Yacht Club of the Baltic Sea. A race that takes every sailor to his or her mental and physical limits. Nord Stream Race, connecting Baltics through sport. So there's a lot to take in there, and uh, so with, there's there's a lot for us to dig into with what we've just seen on that video, Su Suzanne. Um, now you've been to the Olympics, you've sailed in small boats. How much offshore racing have you done in big boats going far out to sea, out of sight of land? If it counts sailing around the, like the Danish waters with my family when I was a kid, then that's the most offshore racing I've done. No, literally I haven't done any offshore racing. And uh, I would say it's quite far away from, from sailing these J70s as, the, um, as these sailors have qualified themselves into the Nordstrom race by, by sailing these. Um, it's a quite different boat, the Clubs 150. Uh, just the manpower. We have in the smaller boats typically three or four persons. In these boats we have ten. So here on board and we can see... That's with the Danish team, right? That's with your team, if we can say that. And yeah. uh, we, we had the skipper's face up there, Peter Vara. Now tell us a little bit about Peter. Do you know him? Yeah, Peter, he's a Danish sailor legend. He, uh, he has been sailing his whole life and is kind of like one of the famous Danish sailors we have. His son won the gold medal in 2008 in the 49er. Yeah, I don't know, everyone, I guess, rem rem remembers this epic uh, 49er medal race where uh, the Danes had to borrow a Croatian boat and... Yeah, at least we Danes remember that. Um, I, I've heard that maybe he was Optimist World Champion as, um, as well. Is that true? He was, uh, he's been really good in the Optimist. I don't know if he's been world champion, but he's been at the Worlds a lot of times. And uh, he is re a really, really good sailor. He's won a bunch of things. And he's also very good in different things. Like he sails the Dragon, he sails the J70, also two very different boats. And uh, he's always in for new projects. So uh, he's, he's one of maybe the experienced guys we have here in the Nordstrom race, but uh, he's very youth in his uh, head. So that's, that's a great uh, thing for him. Great, right, great. Right. And, and now yeah. you mentioned the J70 there, which is a significant boat in the story of the Nord Stream race. 
Um, so uh, just tell me, if, if I wanted to do, well, firstly, I, I, I'm not from a Baltic nation. Let's say if you wanted to do, you being Danish, wanted to do the Nord Stream race, what would be the pathway for getting there? So in, uh, to get into the Nord Stream race, you have to participate in these leagues that are around every nation uh, in the whole world, actually. But if, to get into the Baltic uh, race here in the Nord Stream race, you need to be one of, like from Germany, Denmark, Sweden, Finland or Russia. And then you need to win the national league there and then you'll qualify for the Nord Stream race. So, so this is like a, a club league between all the yacht clubs in, in that specific uh, nation, right? Yes. So it is kind of like, this is kind of like the, the, the grand prize for winning that league among your clubs in your country. Okay. So the, the, the strange thing is that this, uh, this club competition, uh, the, the league racing, takes place in 22 foot, four person sports boats called J70s. Yes. Big dinghies, really. Yes, yes. they've got a keel on them, but they're big dinghies. Yeah, and they're you, kind I, of like keel boats that can't capsize. The right, best of both, right? right? <laughs> well, I, I've managed to capsize really? one there. <laughs> um, but, but anyway, I mean, they're, they're, you don't go out to sea with these things. You just do short, sharp races that last 10 minutes. Yes. And if you get really, really good at winning these fleet races that last only 10 minutes in these really small boats, you get the chance, if you win your national league, to you're given the keys to one of these 50-foot race boats that we're seeing now. It's, it's like you, you get really good at, um, at racing a go-kart and then someone gives you the keys to a Formula One car. Yes, it's a little bit like this, actually. And, uh, but it's a dream that's coming true for a lot of these sailors because I think that's what they're aiming for as well. A lot of these, we've been speaking a lot with the, the sailors the last couple of days and they really, this is their dream. They want to do ocean racing. They want to do more of big boat racing. So for them, this is a stepping stone to get get into uh, bigger boats. So this is a great opportunity that the Nord Stream is providing these sailors. Okay, well, seeing as I'm talking to a Dane and we're looking at the Danish boat, let's dig further into uh, what this team are all about. We've got a chance of a lifetime to be sailing these amazing boats in this fantastic race. We are entering the race with humility and proudness to represent our club and our country. It's going to be a challenge because three of our four competitors are sailing this race for the second time and we are in it for the very first time. However, we also see this as a development project for the next generation of Danish offshore sailors. We always sail to win. And we are definitely gonna improve our team for each of the four legs of the Nord Stream Race 2019. Okay, so a couple of interesting points there. Uh, Peter Vara said this is their first time doing the race. He talked about their lack of experience. Um, also talked about the opportunity that the Nord Stream race offers to bring on the next generation of young Danish sailors and, and where that might take them. And, and when they talk about that, I, I suppose they're, they're talking about opening up possibilities of, of going into uh, to, to even more offshore races, maybe the, the big round the world races, what used to be called the Volvo Ocean Race, now the the ocean race. Um, and, and also the other big classics, things like the, the Fastnet race and the the Sydney Hobart. Do you, do, you, do you think that's where some of these sailors might be aspiring in, in getting a chance to get a thousand miles of offshore experience like this? I think so. And uh, as, I, as we talked about before, this Nordstrom race is a very good step stone to, to get into this stepping stone. Um, and I must say the Danish are a mix of like they also have some offshore experience with them. They have their two, I would say, uh, yeah, uh, super good sailors, Christian, Hans Christian Rosendale and Lars Peter Rosendale. They are kind of like... Um, 
yeah, famous in Denmark for being these blonde twins who have a lot of energy and that just boosts a team. And they're doing a lot of uh, Club Swan 50 and other big boat racing um, around in the whole world. So they are luckily for the Danish team, they're taking part of, of this uh, team and helping them uh, getting to know the Club Swan 50. So they will participate until the Stockholm stopover. So um, how old are these brothers? They're only 23, actually. So uh, even though they're young, yeah, they're one of the most experienced uh, Club Swan 50s uh, aboard this team. We also have other uh, good sailors on this team. For example, we have Christian Kiergetap, who won the bronze in the world in Optimist eight years ago. And again, that's a totally different boat, but he's actually going to be the tactician on this boat. So his head is... I talked to Peter, the, the skipper, uh, about Christian, and Christian is one of the sharpest sailors he's ever had on board. He is never in doubt with any calls on the tactics and stuff like that. So it's, it is really... a, a funny team to watch, I think, because we have the different experience, and they, I also think they have the the lowest middle age. So, uh, yeah, definitely going to be exciting to see okay. how they will do today. I, I seem to recognize that surname as well. Kirkutep, that sounds yeah. uh, like a relative of uh, Rasmus Kirkutep, who with Jonas Wara, Peter's son, the, uh, there's, there's, there's sort of a lot of family history here. That, those yeah, but two it, won I the don't Olympic. think they're related, actually. They're not related, no, okay. But, uh, it's, uh, yeah, but it's true. Uh, Kirkutep and Wara won the, the gold there in 2008 as we talked about okay so they're, they're up against uh four other teams um who else do you do you want to tell us about uh we could talk a little bit about the germans who are in the picture now uh they are uh, one of the teams who actually have a little bit of experience from last year because they it's their second year in a row uh participating here at the north stream race uh, a lot of these sailors are but the north daughter regatta has actually participated at the north stream race four times in total um, the skipper of the team is Sven Erik Horsch, and uh, we also have a lot of other great team members on board. Okay. Um, so uh, they showed great promise in the inshore racing, but uh, they weren't so happy with their offshore performance. They, they lacked the experience last year. Yes. Um, so uh, I, I believe that we've got a, uh, a, an option to uh, see a little bit more about them on, uh, on their own team video. Uh, but uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, I understand we got that video now. So let's uh, see a little bit more about the Germans. I'm definitely proud to present my club and nation at the Nordstrom race, but I'm also looking forward to awesome races against other nations in the Baltic. So last year we were very happy with our inshore performance, but offshore we had some troubles and we learned from those troubles and hopefully we will make not the same mistakes again and perform even better offshore. For me as an inshore sailor it was a completely different experience, especially the long trip from Copenhagen to Stockholm and all the way from Stockholm to Helsinki with tough weather and but also some close calls in between those boats, these big boats. So. I'm looking forward to racing again. Now, I'm definitely excited to sail offshore again. Our goal is uh, definitely to have the strong inshore performance and do even better offshore. So let's see what the Germans can do to improve on their performance last year. There's also a, another German that we should mention, uh, Gerhard Schroeder, the, the former Chancellor of Germany, effectively the, the Prime Minister, the head of Germany from 20-odd years ago. Uh, so he's going to be officially starting the race today. So that, that's quite a coup. I think that's got quite a lot of media interested in, in seeing uh, the ex-Chancellor Schroeder involved in the race today. Yes, he's going to come out and cheer for, for the Germans, of course, and, and start the whole race. Uh, he's also a chairman of uh, Nord Stream AG, so he is a, yeah, he's very involved in, in this race, you can say. Um, so, yeah, he will be our very, very important person out there today.
Okay. Um, and Nord Stream, of course, being a, um, a Russian company, and um, so we, we should also look at the, the Russians. Now, it's the Russians who won last year, but it was a different set of Russians for, for the reasons of the fact that not every, it's not always going to be the same team that wins their National Sailing League. So I think last year, when uh, Lord of the Sail Asia won the race in St. Petersburg, they already knew that they probably weren't going to come back the following year because they hadn't been winning the league in the J70. So it's no. a strange thing that you could be winning a race and, and you would be the defending champion, but you're not actually allowed to come back because you haven't ticked the first box, which is to win your National Sailing League. Instead of them, it was the Leviathan sailing team. Yeah, and it is a little bit like where you put your focus. I know that the Russian team last year, they did a lot of preparation for the Nord Stream race. So they were really focusing on the training here. So I think maybe that's why they lacked a little bit in, in the National League. And they did a great job because they went, they went around, uh, away with the, with the trophy, So uh, the Russians last year. So it was a great job from their side. And I know that this uh, team this year are very, very eager on taking the, the win again and feel some pressure from at home. Uh, yeah, and I think we maybe have something about them as well. Yes, so let's find out a little bit more about this Russian team. Are we proud? Yeah, sure, of course, because uh, we, we're really proud to be a part of a North Stream race because uh, uh, we won the national, uh, Russian National uh, Sailing League and uh, it's, a, it's a big honor for us to represent Russia uh, in the North Stream race. Actually it will be quite complicated for us this year because the uh, Russian team won uh, in 2018 and um, we definitely we will, we, we, we will try to to do our best to, to repeat the, the result of Russian team in 2018. That's, that's our main goal. Yeah. So the new Russian team are feeling the pressure of having to live up to what the Russian team yes. uh, achieved last year. Now, both of us were actually following the race last year. You're following the whole race this year. I've been left at home uh, on bad <laughs> behavior or something. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, but uh, they, they feel like they've got a lot, lot to live up to because the Russians really dominated last year, didn't they? They did. They did an amazing job. They had an amazing team uh, and they were so full of power and so professional. And I think their strength was actually that they have the whole they had the same team the whole way through other clubs or other countries have switched around a little bit among team members but the russians were super strong last year yes okay and this year we actually have two really experienced sailors with us um Mikhail Sheremetev and his brother Maxim they actually did the olympic twice uh in 28 uh, 2008 and 2012 they uh they competed for Russia in the 470. So, and we have a lot of other good sailors on board this team. So maybe a different team this year, but I'm quite sure they will uh, perform well again. They, they've really shown good uh, moves here in the training. So uh, yeah, it's going to be exciting to see today. Olympic sailors, they're always great for the attention to detail, aren't they? They're, they're very analytical. Um, they, they know how to break down a campaign. Exactly. It's all about this with campaigning. I know the North Stream race is not as the same as, as the Olympic Games. The Olympic Games is a four-year um, process with the goal of the Olympics. And the North Stream race is every year. So you can, maximum for a year, you can prepare yourself. Um, but just leading a project, uh, putting up a team, uh, planning everything, uh, that is, uh, that is what, what Olympic sailors are used to. And I'm sure these two guys are doing that in, in this team uh, th this year. Yeah. Just to update you, we've got about 11 minutes to the start of the race. So um, what will the, the teams be doing right now, Suzanne, in the final 10 minutes before they actually... Uh, go across the start line? Well, first of all, they got both their sails up now. They haven't had earlier on. So now they're starting to trim uh, and everyone is, you can see, standing up and looking around, even stepping a little bit to maybe get some pulse up or heart rate up and, and try to see if they can 
because it's a lot about it's not a lot of wind but it's a lot about getting this uh, you know you need to get this, the focus in your brain and you need to be super aware of everything that's going on so even though it's light winds you need to have uh, adrenaline uh, that's up in the sky okay and in the background, you can see a big wheel for, for people to, to go around. And, and, and just out of picture, we saw a tall ship as well. There's a lot going on in, in Kiel Week. And, and actually, it's an enormous sailing event. But there are also people that come to, to see some of the best bands in the world play here. They come to drink a lot of beer and, um, and eat, eat, eat a lot of bratwurst as well. So, so there's, there's a huge onshore festival taking yes. place in downtown Kiel. And some people may not even be aware that there's the sailing regatta going on. That's how big the whole of Kiel Week is, isn't it? It's, it's true. It's a very big event. And, uh, and I've been there last year because we had to make a, a little promo video for, for Kiel because of the Nord Stream race. And it was amazing to see so many people having a great time and uh, really enjoying themselves. But I, I'm, I'm, I think you're right. They didn't know what was going out out here. <laughs> but uh, that's, it's a great festival. And I think it's known in the most of, of Europe for, for this Kiel Week. And, and sailing is a big part of it, uh, that's for sure. But, but yeah. Okay, so th these guys with less than 10 minutes to go, all they're thinking about is how they're going get, to get across this start line. It's what we call a transit line. It's lining up two posts on the shore uh, on a start line organized by uh, the Kiel Yacht Club, which is the original founding yacht club of Kiel Week. So that's obviously by nature of the fact that Kiel Week's been around for 138 years. We're talking about probably one of the oldest yacht clubs in Germany, I'm guessing. Yes, uh, and the start line will be right outside this club. And uh, yeah, it will be really epic to see all these 300, we can actually see in the picture now, all these white sails that are, um, that are out there. It's, it looks amazing. It's going to be a big show. Um, now, uh, one team that we're seeing in the middle of the picture just sailing off to the left there are the Finns. Uh, so, Suzanne, let's see a, a, a little video about the Finnish team and then we'll talk about them afterwards. <laughs> It was an absolutely amazing experience. Uh, we started off with uh, with the Kiel Woche, with uh, course racing in in Kiel, and then then we went all the way from from Kiel to St. Petersburg. It was amazing. Uh, of course, it, that is, is a great honor. It, it's a great honor for the club to 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 win the Champions League and and get the possibility to to join the North Stream race and and then to, to sail through the, the Scandinavian countries under the flag of Finland. That that's it, it's really cool. We, we learned a lot last year and, and uh, there, there are, are people on board that, that, that was also there last year and we also so recruited some, some really good offshore sailors from Finland to, to take with us, so I, I think they, they are, are better prepared than ever. I think it's, uh, uh, it, it's a fantastic event with, with what's happening in all the harbours, with, with the, the import races, that there is a lot of spectators looking at this and, and, and when we sail the boats with, with the flags in the, in the mainsails and, and I think it's, it's re really an uh, excellent way of, of, of joining the, the Baltic countries. So the Club Swan 50, the boat that we're talking about, is actually made in Finland as well by Nautor Swan. So there's a Finnish connection with the actual hardware that they're using with yeah. these boats as well. Yeah, I wonder if it gives them some home water advantages. I, I don't Do know. Do they get an extra special Club Swan 50 because they're from Finland? I don't they're know. They're actually there from Åland. <laughs> so tell us about... Oland, because that's a special part of Finland, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's a very special part, and they are very proud of being uh, from Oland. It's an island in the middle of Bel the Baltic Sea, a little bit outside Finland, and uh, they have now participated for the second year at the, this uh, Nord Stream race, and this year it's a new team. So uh, some, peop some of the sailors are the same from last year, but most of them are actually new uh, to the Nord Stream race. So also going to be very exciting to see how they will perform. Also, uh, as we talked about with the Danish team, they're also uh, sailors that are mixed in age. They, they have both young and older experienced sailors. So it's going to be really exciting to see their, their performance, that's for sure. 
Uh, they also have a lot of world champions and European champions uh, on board their team. And later on, an Olympic sailor will uh, join as well. So, yeah, it's, it's going to be... Do you know who that is? Uh, it's, an, a, it's a 49er sailor. I can't remember what okay. he's called actually right now. Okay. Uh, but, yeah, he is, um, he's going to join them later. And they're very proud of that. And, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, now, um, Orland is uh, sort of halfway between Finland and Sweden, Sweden being the only other team that we haven't yet talked about. So uh, now you've got a Swedish connection as well. Yeah, you're married to a Swede. Yes, I am. So, so I'm I, living in Sweden, actually. Right. So who, yeah. who will you be cheering for? I don't know. Actually, I'm going to race with the Swedes tomorrow because I'm going to be uh, on board, uh, not reporter, but I'm going to do some, uh, yeah, get some experience from on board uh, tomorrow uh, when they have their first offshore race. I'm going to join them to Copenhagen, the Swedish team. So, of course, I, um, I'm going to vote uh, or like, yeah, cheer a little bit for them today. But, but um, yeah, I don't know. I'm a mix of everything. You know, I speak German as well and I have Finnish friends and I'm like... Well, I, now we're looking for the Russian connection because... He yeah, probably, I don't yeah. know. I was anyway, in we'll St. Go- Petersburg last year and I loved it. So, <laughs> okay. I mean, I'm cheering for everyone. That, that's good enough. Yeah. Um, now, they've got a very charismatic helmsman, Christian Harding. Let's talk about the team a little bit more. Let's just watch the video on them first. I think that the, the, the Nord Stream race was a great experience. I mean, uh, it's a great chance for the yacht club's young member to get out on the ocean uh, and uh, gain a lot of experience for the future and uh, to compete against uh, four other teams in equal boats. That's just something amazing and that's uh, actually one of the main reasons that we compete in the Champions League to try to win that spot and to have the chance to Uh, educate our young sailors into offshore sailing. Well, it's a great honor, of course, to represent the the yacht club, the the Royal Swedish Yacht Club, and uh, I think it's good. I mean, we're uh, focusing on getting young sailors into the offshore racing, uh, and as I said, educate them. Yeah, I think it's great. I mean, uh, you start in Germany and you visit more or less all the Nordic countries on the way, and then you end up in uh, St. Petersburg in Russia, so uh, it's a great way to really feel that the Baltic Sea is important for all the countries. So that was one of the Swedes, Bjorn Hansen, telling us about the appeal of doing this race. He's a, a great match racer, one of the best in the world. Um, so very much a small boat sailor, but also enjoys taking part in the Nord Stream race. And now we've only got about three minutes to go. So we're getting to the business end of this pre-start. And there we can see Christian Harding, the skipper of the Swedish team at the wheel, issuing instructions. Uh, normally a very laid back character, but uh, can you afford to be laid back with just two minutes to go before the start? No, I think we see a very focused team right now. I can see that they are very tend, t- their tension is high in the boat. They're all like looking around and they're all standing up and ready to race. And, uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm sure they are a little bit nervous right now. It's the first race and it's the kickoff of the Nottingham race. Yes, and they're going to see all kinds of conditions. It's not going to be so benign and sunny for the whole 1,000 miles on the way. I mean, we really saw everything last year. Um, But right now, it's the focus on the start of what we call the welcome race for Kiel Avoca, for Kiel Week. Um, See an old ship just going through the start line now. I mean, there's a lot of commercial traffic that goes through here as well. I I don't know what kind of restrictions there are on ferries and and, um, and other shipping going in and out of here. But they're going to have to navigate all the other boats that aren't even racing as well. Yeah, it's it's some obstacles they have to work around. And and, um, they're used to doing that if it's a moving object like this or it's a something uh, a pier or something because they will be racing out the channel right now so uh, yeah this will be a part of the race here in kill week now it's all about uh, timing and uh, counting the the or calculating the distance to this gate where they will start through it will be uh, 
and not a classic start line they have. They will have this transit start. And uh, yeah, this is all about keeping the speed in the boat and uh, getting the right timing. Uh, yeah, and we see, I don't know where we have the fifth boat, but we have five boats racing here, right? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. Who are we missing? We're missing the, the Finnish team in that graphic at the moment. But hopefully we get five boats. So just one minute to the line. We hear a little bit of screaming there on board. You can hear that. I, this is the, the blonde tactician I was talking to you about, one of the twins. Uh, the he, as you say, he, do, he doesn't suffer from self-doubt, does he? No. Even no. on that brief clip, you, you <laughs> can see there, there, there's, there's quite a strong character there. Yeah, I spoke with him this morning and he said everything is on us here in the beginning because no one else has the Swan 50 experience, so we need to do all the calls. And he's actually in the back being the tactician and his brother, his twin brother, is in the front doing the bow. So they're actually keeping like track of both sides of the boat. Uh, so oh, that's right. pretty cool. Yeah. Okay, okay. So they're putting themselves under pressure to win these intro races. They think they should have the edge with their Club Swan 50 experience, do they? I think so, yeah. Just five, just over five seconds to the start. Five, four, three, two, one. Sweden just turning up towards the breeze. Just to lure to them is Russia. And a good start also for Germany. Not much breeze, so none of the boats going particularly quickly right now. No, but it's all about, even though it's not quick, it's about being the quickest anyway, because it's uh, in this light wind breeze, it's, it's really vital to be the fastest and get out to where there's a lot of wind. Now, we talked about the Danes yes. wanting to put their best foot forward. I think that's why we had a screaming twin there in the back of the boat before he, he realized uh, these 30 seconds before that they were going to be too late. And they are definitely having a really bad start here in the first inshore race at the Nord Stream race. Well, you, you've had all this time. You, you've had an hour, however long you want. Oh, what does this mean? Were the Russians over on the start line? Have they had to go back and restart, I wonder? If so, then that's going to be disastrous for the Russians. Pretty hard to tell what's going on here right now, but it does look like Russia has been told that they were over early on the start line and will have to turn back. So maybe things not as but We thought it was bad for the Danes. It might be even worse for the Russians. So at the moment, it looks like the race is being led between these two boats in picture, Finland on the right and Germany in the distance on the left. I really think that... Uh yeah, we got to see what's going on later on uh, because the Swedes have also been uh, uh, maybe over the line or something. We, we are guessing here, aren't yeah, we? Yeah, we, we will probably get some information uh, in, in a second. But, uh, but the Finnish and the Germans look really strong there and they can now decide to kind of like both protect their, their lead, but they can also go out and find the wind as the first boats. And that is going to be the essential thing today in this light, light breeze. Yes, yes. So, um, I mean, the light breeze maybe gives them an opportunity, the people that were over, to come back and attack because it could be quite fluky. It's, it's something like a 12-mile race. It's quite a short race for boats of this size today. Um, in good breeze, that would probably take them, what, um, an hour and a half, but we're probably looking at a little bit longer today. We talked about it previously, that it's the welcome race of the Kieler Woche, the Kiel Week, and actually this race is called the Alregatta, so it's like you get a smoked eel in, at the finish line, but the Nord Stream race uh, will only take part of some of the race because they have three more or two more intro races after this today. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, it is, um, it's going to be ending right outside here where we stand, outside the the Olympic Harbour here in Kiel. So, so through the channel and out and then uh, where we are, kind of. Okay. Now, th th this Il Regatta, uh, so some of the other boats, the 300-odd boats that are racing, are racing a little bit further round to a place beyond the lighthouse where the Clubs 150s will be finishing yeah. um, to a, a village called Eckenforda. Yeah. And when you arrive, you get awarded with a smoked eel. Yes. I mean, sometimes people <laughs> ask me outside of sailing, so how much <laughs> prize money, money do they win? Yeah, and that's they about say, it. Well, no, there is no prize money. So why they do it? Because they enjoy sailing. Yes. But then... Imagine that. Eel. And a smoked eel. I mean, everyone would go sailing if they knew there was a smoked eel to win at the end of a race, wouldn't they? I mean, why don't all regattas do this? I mean, what kind of incentive is that? I don't know. It's, it's, but look at these pictures. We just saw the finish before. Uh, even though they're like very much into focus and, and trying, I think they're in the lead of this race right now. They're also, it, it's beautiful pictures. Having the sun and, uh, and uh, yeah, light breeze there, racing these 
super cool Club Swan 50s. Uh, this is the award, I would say. Um, so the Finns must be really pleased with how things are going for them so far. Um, so here's the 3D graphic, the, the overhead shot using our SAP 3D graphics. Let's take a, a look at where this race is going to be taking them if, if we zoom out. So we're, we're looking at uh, uh, the city of Kiel in the background. And then as we pan round in the distance sort of at the top of the screen is more or less uh, where we are at the, uh, the, uh, the Olympic Sailing Center. And then further over to the right, just out of picture maybe, but top right-hand corner is, is where they're going to be aiming for this lighthouse. Um, so that lighthouse uh, from the start to the finish is about just over 12 nautical miles. So they've got this race out through, the, uh, through Keel Bay, um, with a lot of traffic out there, a lot of other boats going to be doing their racing. We're next to where all the, um, the small boats are, are launching from. So there, there's going to be a lot of traffic out there for these boats to think about, as well as the four other boats in their own fleet that they're thinking about competing against. Definitely, but uh, they're luckily one of the biggest boats here in, in the fleet. We also have two of the old Volvo Ocean Race boats uh, competing here at the Vol Welcome Race. Uh, so, uh, yeah, but these these sails will be the tallest and will have probably the most wind of, of all here in outside Kiel. So it is a long race and, and it's a thousand miles. So it, it's, a couple of these guys seem to be getting some rest early on. They're, they're, <laughs> they're lying down at the front of the boat. Why, why are they doing that? Um, they are doing that to kind of like avoid the wind to break the boat. So they are just trying to be as low as possible. And yeah, it's uh, to be as aerodynamic as possible, actually. So, so all those tiny details on such a big boat and people are lying down just to reduce the wind drag. Yes, yes. It right. is every detail counts. And uh, yesterday they were all... Um, cleaning the bottom of their boats and all these small details can actually help the sailors talked about that it's a, a difference of a half to a whole knot of speed compared to if you haven't cleaned the boat so it is very important here you can see what, the what are they boat. cleaning it of you, I mean, you can see here on the picture that it's a little bit brownish in the, okay. in the underneath that's because the the water will grow slowly there will grow small yeah animals yeah grass, plant, stuff, plant growth all uh, that yeah okay. natural things yeah. um and uh you will, as a sailor, you will try to avoid that. So they've been diving yesterday and taking off that. The color doesn't say everything. It's more about what you get off. So the finish, as they look now, they look fast. So probably they got most of it out yesterday. But that's the aim. All these small details are really mattering. And uh, they're, they're like sailing is a very complex sport. And they have so many things to think about. The aerodynamics, as we talked about before, the clean bottom. But what they're doing right now is the trimming that's going to be and looking for wind that's going to be the most important things for them because if you are fast and you get out to the wind uh, as the first boat you're going to be uh, winning this race yes and at the moment this looks like a two horse race between germany and finland because of two other teams being over early on the start we thought they'd got great starts but but no it it wasn't so good um for russia or for Sweden, they had to turn back around and restart, which actually was a bit of a get out of jail for the Danish who had a, a terrible start, but at least they weren't over early. So yeah. that's now put the Danish up into third place. Yes. I think. I'm, I can't tell from that graphic at the moment. Um, can't see the other, the other two boats in shot, uh, but you can see that there is a big gap between the front two who are effectively match racing each other, Finland against Germany. The other three at the moment are really just making up the numbers. Here we can see the Danish team again. It's uh, Peter Vaat at, at the rudder in his kind of like Aussie cap, I would say. <laughs> He's wearing there to protect from the sun. But, uh, and who's that in the hatchway? That's who's... one of the twins we saw there. I think it's the tactician. And you can also see they were all trying to move forward. And that's also a trimming of the boat in the weight. So he, instead of standing in the back, he went and stand in the middle of the boat instead. Um, to he, he looks like he does have a lot of energy. I mean, he, <laughs> he, he's bouncing up and down the whole time, isn't yes, he? he is. He is. He's a very energetic uh, boy. You have to meet him later, Andy. Yeah. Um, but uh, we have uh, here we have the, the Russians. And again, you can see they're low on the boat and, uh, and very concentrated, I would say. Uh, so very they're probably calm. A little bit, yeah. And I would say probably a little bit disappointed after and a super good start, but actually a little bit too good because it was over the line. So they had to go back again. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, but I think like the spirit on, on a team is never giving up. It's always like we have to fight back. We know we have a lot of miles in front of us, uh, not just here in Kiel, but in the whole Nordrum race. So uh, it's about getting all these 
uh, try to, to hunt the others as, as much as possible. And you can see there's not a lot of wind, but what's really impressive as they go past the scenery so quickly is just how efficient these boats are. They're, they're very light, they're, they're, they're quite powerful, mm -hmm. and it doesn't seem to take a lot of wind to really get these Clubs 150s moving. No, no, and uh, you can see they have a, a little heel as well, so actually I think the wind has been picking up more and more, and... Uh, and they are actually, yes, you can see a couple of legs outside the side as well. So I think it's, uh, yeah, it may, it may probably has built a little bit during the morning and, and, uh, and they're having enough, definitely enough race, uh, wind to race. But they don't have as much crew weight forwards on the Russian boat as we saw maybe on the, the leading two boats. It no. seems like they haven't got as many people forwards. So you would think uh, they'd, that you'd see more similarity between the, the weight distribution. Yes, maybe they don't know the trick, I don't know, or maybe they don't agree in the trimming. It's, everything is personalized on every boat, and it's also not only with the trim of the weights, but also the trim of the sails. And uh, yeah, we will see in a couple of hours who has made the best decision, uh, who has been the best and fastest boat. Okay. Germans so here in the picture now. And, and the Danes uh, j just in the middle of the, the picture. So the, the Danes still very much in the hunt here by the look of it. Yes, and if I look at the picture now, it looks as if there could be a little bit of breeze in front of the Danish. Um, so, yeah, it's exciting to see this split going on right now between Germany and Denmark. And especially since Germany were one of the leading boats out the start. Um, yeah, because wind will really be your best friend here today when there's not a lot of it. Uh, you really want to want to go for it. Looks like some relaxed Russian sailors there. And you, I think you've really got to keep calm in these conditions. You've sort of your mood to a some extent has to match the wind, doesn't it? And you can ask yourself if one of these guys on, on the boat is actually like checking out his Facebook profile or if he's the. Uh, but no, everyone is having their iPads with them, and and uh, it's the tactician. Uh, I think in this case it is um, Maxim, the, the, the brother of the, the captain, the one we were talking about before, who is... Maxim um, Sheremetev. Yes, who is also uh, a Ex previous uh, Olympic sailor. And I think he's the tactician. And uh, yeah, he's keeping an eye on, on the weather forecast and the speed and, and everything. Um, he, he, everything he can try to get out of the iPad, he will. And he will inform his team, if, inform the skipper, the helmsman, and do the tactics out of what he gets of information. Looks as if the Russia got out to a little bit of more breeze because more legs, that's always, always an indication, right? More legs out of the side means more wind. So, uh, right. so, so we have a little bit more breeze here on the Russian, Russian team and um, they look as if they're going fast right now, I would say. More heel, more legs out. They're looking strong right now, I would say. Yes, they do. So that's, that's probably as much wind as we've seen so far. So they're, they're coming out of uh, the city centre, getting more into the open sea now. So maybe the breeze is opening up a little bit for them. Uh, you can see in the background occasionally some huge ships there. Some of it looks military. Um, and uh, there, there's, there's such a culture of, um, of maritime here. So much of the city is involved and, and interested in life on the sea here. Yeah, it, it is, uh, it's a beautiful scenery, actually, to yeah, be reminded of. We have these contrasts. We have these super modern Swan 50s full of carbon fiber. And uh, then we have these like, older ships around and the military ships. I, I think it's a beautiful combination. And yeah, it, it's, it's, it reminds us where we're coming from. And, and that's just great to see. And it's quite an adventure going on this race, isn't it? You're, you're going through the Baltic Sea. You're, you're going from culture to culture. And, and one of the messages of the race, the Nord Stream race, is connecting Baltics through sport. Yes. So the, the idea of um, bringing together these, these different traditions and cultures and, and uh, helping the sailors and everybody else who's involved in the race and following the race um, understand a little bit more about each other and um, and the differences and also the similarities between those different nations. Yeah, I um, I know that there's there's some different themes and the different stopovers. So here we're now in Kiel. It's uh, business or uh, companies and sailing. That's the focus. So connecting businesses. And uh, the next stopover, which will be in Copenhagen, it will be connecting through food because, uh, of course, uh, Copenhagen is uh, like a metropole for good dining and then in uh, Stockholm it will be uh, focused on connecting uh, using the sailing as a c connecting yeah, women in general and, and uh, making it more 
attracting for women to sail, especially also offshore races. And in Helsinki, there will be a focus on other sports. So I've heard there will be some hot shots uh, Finnish ice hockey players joining us for some of the races, uh, which will be very cool to see how their skills can be used on a boat. And then in Russia, it will be art and um, culture that will be in, in focus there to how to connect these Baltic countries. So every stopover has its own theme. And uh, yeah, it will be very cool to, to, to see this as a part of the race. Nice. And we've just seen uh, some, boat, uh, some sailors on the Russian boat moving across to the other side of the boat. What are they up to at the moment? Uh, probably a change in the tactics. We saw the tactician before looking in the iPad and uh, probably he is he, he believes something is better <laughs> going that way. So they made an attack. And uh, yeah, now you can see the, the trimmer here in the picture with his red cap. He just did the last adjustments to the jib in the front. And now he's also going to trim, I think, probably a little bit in a halyard or something. Uh, probably more and more breeze is, is, or he's making ready to probably trim it um, to the other side, the, the jib when they attack. But yeah, it's, it looks as if they're having a, like more wind. It looks nice uh, from our perspective. And uh, yeah, also it's a very narrow uh, place they sail. So they have to do tax at some point. Luckily for us, we'll have something to watch as well. Um, so at the back, it's uh, it's the Russians racing against the Swedes. Those places are changing for fourth and fifth quite regularly. So it's the, it's the race not to be last at the moment for those two. But of course, the, the, it's only 300 meters to the lead. So there, there's still at least 10 miles of sailing to be done. So so there is still a chance of any of these boats winning. Um, but at the moment, uh, the the front two that got such good starts. Actually, no, I, I, I was, was going to say that it was the Finns and the Germans, but according to our stats there, the Danish may well have moved up into second place ahead of the Germans. Yeah, really lucky for them, thinking about that they got the worst start of them all, but they were not over the line, uh, which, of course, then made them back in the game because the Swedes and the Russian had to go uh, down and, and, and cross the line again. So uh, the Danes were a little bit saved by an angel there and uh, are back up in the, almost in the lead, now only 100 meters from leading. And uh, yeah, but of course the, the Finnish are still 100 meters ahead of them, so they need to more catching up. But, but up. at the moment, uh, quite close between the front yes. three and then a bit, of, a bit of a gap back to the other two, uh, the Swedes and the Russians who, was, had to, who were over early and had to go back and restart. Very, very expensive. Um, and I would say um, if I was a tactician on these boats, I would rather be five meters under than actually five meters over because it is so expensive. Maneuvering 10 people, like even just getting aware of the fact that you're over, we could see it took a little bit of time. And then afterwards, like communicating to everyone on board, we were over, like... we. Be ready to to dock down the the start line again. It's it's a big procedure and it's very very expensive maneuvering these boats uh, around. So but um, th that start was a transit start, which means basically you're sighting along two posts on the shore, and and so I think those are sometimes quite difficult to get right. True. Um, yeah. So if you if you imagine. Um, there's there's one there's a right hand side of the post or the left hand side of the post. Which side of the post is actually the bit that the race officer is is sighting down? So there's quite a big room um, for, for for error there. But that's another reason why you should start five yes, or maybe exactly. ten meters behind the line because you're not really exactly sure no. where that start line is. It's not the a risk worth taking, I would say, in this long long race and especially having this many. Uh yeah, offshore races ahead of you as well. It's it's um, when you see Olympics um, Olympian sailors, they will they're gonna be on the start line when when the shoot, shoot is off. But I think offshore racing, especially in this transit line, I think the most smart thing for for the Swedes and the Russians would have been to have a little bit of more uh, gap towards the start line because it it was a, an expensive mistake. Today. Well, on the Russian boat, you mentioned that there are those brothers the, the, who campaigned uh, two Olympic games for Russia in the 470, uh, a 15 foot. Uh, well, 4.7 meter boat. Um, and so I wonder if they were being a little bit too <laughs> yes. pushy on, on, on the start line, thinking, well, come on, guys, you've got to be right up on this line because that's what they've spent their whole careers doing. Offshore racing, 
um, is really a, a very different game. It's 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 a, we in. Uh, I, I don't know if you have the story in Denmark, the tortoise and the hare. No, tell me. Okay, so the the hare goes herring off down the the track, um, and uh, they got they got a race on. No way is the tortoise going to win. But then the hare gets gets a bit lazy, and decides to have a bit of a nap in the sunshine, <laughs> and the tortoise just ambles on by, and um, the hare w wakes up later on and realizes it's too late, and the tortoise has won. This is okay. You, you can't be as slow as a tortoise no, in the no. Nord Stream race, but this is not all about winning the start. It's it's about being consistent, yes. not necessarily winning every moment at the race, but never losing. And, and those two boats lost that moment in the race. Yes, they did. And it's going to probably cost them the possibility of winning this race. Um, yeah, it is. Um, you normally say in fleet racing, you say that, that uh, a start can be something about around 80% of the, of the actual race. But in this case, it actually is was 99% of the of getting them in the back of the race. So it's uh, well, you're making an early call there. I think. I mean, we really still, okay. Yes, we, I we am. Still, we still have a lot of race to go here. I think. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't Keep write them the, off yet. Yes, no, that's true. But it's going to be hard for them, and uh, they 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 are as we said before. They would have been like they should have been having a little bit of more. Um, yeah, space towards the starting line to avoid this happening to them. A big risk from their side. Here we have the Danish on, on board, the, the SD's Epping Twins, as I, as I told you about. You can see one of them, I think, there the, in the picture. The, there's one on the right-hand side up, up front. Is that one of the twins there? I think so. And then we have one, I think it's his hand actually holding uh, the back uh, of the... And uh, Yeah, it would be interesting to, uh, to be able to hear the audio as well and, and hear you what will, the discussion is. We have the GoPros on, on board these uh, boats and we... We're, you aren't really able to hear. We, we didn't hear anything from the Russians, for example, but these twins are very loud, so I think we can actually <laughs> okay. hear them through the GoPro uh, case. So that's amazing. I think that's the Russians here. Super quiet. Okay. Two wheels on, on these boats, which makes it way more easy for um, the helmsman to be up on deck. Um, and see, we can see in the left of the picture there, he's moving the rudder a little bit from side to side. And, uh, yeah. And according to our stats top left, uh, the Russians are now up into third place. So something has changed quite dramatically there. Now, um, it, it, and I had we... almost written them off, Andy. You said to me, no, 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 we can't write them off yet. You're totally right. Uh, well, <laughs> I, didn't think, I didn't expect things to change quite as quickly as we're seeing now. I, oh, something must be. I, I'm just wondering if, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, the Russians really are as high up the track as the, it's suggesting there. I wonder if there's a, just a glitch in the GPS tracking or something. Um, I think, <laughs> let's see what, we, we've just got a cross going on here. So the Germans, the Germans are crossing uh, in front of the Danes right there. Right. So very, very close for second yeah. and third place right now. The Finns, who aren't in picture but are, are still leading overall, we're on board, back on board with the Danish crew now. So they will be thinking hard about how to beat these Germans. Um, they, they're going to be crossing tax many more times during this race with the Germans, I would think. You see Always the so animated. <laughs> yes. I'm, they're I'm full worn of energy. out already. They're, they're like, uh, everyone in Denmark knows these two twins, even though they're only 23 years old. They, they, uh, they're, they're super famous for their energy and they're finishing off each other's sentences. And they are like, when you meet them, you just become happy. And yeah, uh, I've, I'm from the same club as them, actually the participating club here, the Royal Danish Yacht Club. Um, so uh, they they are participating in everything they can, and they're sailing full time, and and it's a pleasure to see them joining the Norton race as well. Fantastic, fantastic. So I on on the right hand side, you can see the Finnish flag. They are in the lead. Then the battle for second and third between the Danes at the bottom of the picture, the Germans at the top of the picture, and then that the, that is I think more indicative of where the Russians actually are. So we see the Russians now back in fourth on the leaderboard. So there was something briefly going wrong there, but the Russians are at the moment uh, winning the battle not to be last, and it's the Swedes who are at the back. But we're on board now. Well, we're looking at the leaders of this race right now. It's the Finns from Orlando Segos Salskapet. Yeah, and actually before in the stats, we could see that they were the slowest, so I think that's why people are looking around a little bit. I think they are 
a little bit nervous for their first position because they had almost one knot uh, of less speed than the others. So uh, probably they have a little bit of a uh, lack of wind where they are right now. And that's always hard to be in the lead and then like sailing into a little bit of, of less wind and seeing the, the old ones behind you or the, they're sailing in the old wind that you just had. So, uh, yeah, they are... They're, they're more standing up, you can see, on that boat looking for, for wind right now. Yes, yes, they are. Although, um, yes, well, there, there you see it. The, the Danes are doing over seven knots, and the Swedes at the back are doing over seven knots. The other boats are, are doing less than seven knots. And, the, and the, as, as you just correctly said, Suzanne, the, the Finns are leading this race, but they seem to have the slowest overall average boat speed. So either they have less wind or they're not sailing the boat quite as effectively. Or oh, they didn't clean it well enough underneath, ah, as we talked about could, before. Yes, no, I don't know. Be. But the thing, the th you could see that the team was nervous. They were standing up, as we talked about before. You want to be low on the boat, but... Uh, yeah, I think they were looking for wind. Uh, and all the, all the average speeds are coming down, actually. So, so maybe the, the wind, wind speed yes. is coming down. And that's what the Finnish entered as the first boat being, being the, the leading boat. So it's always a little bit yeah, nervous. But they will probably be the first ones getting the wind uh, soon as well. But they need to do the right call because it's a split behind them. I think the Danish were going out to the right side, the Germans to, to the left. So they need to kind of like... Uh, be sure of how they cover the boat, but still find the, the best uh, wind possibility in front of them. How many days training have they managed to do on these boats? Uh, only uh, uh, two days of training here in Kiel. Um, they could have trained at home in other clubs 150s, but all the, the, race, uh, the, race, uh, the racing sailors here have only had two days, so it's not a lot. And actually, I saw the Russians yesterday. They had a a forced lay day. They weren't allowed to, to train yesterday, but the Russians hoisted the sails and there was not a lot of wind here in the harbor. So they actually did uh, dry training, I think you oh, say right. in English, right? Okay. Uh, where you jump around and pretend that you're actually racing. And I must say I was really impressed because it just showed this eager of the Russians and saying like, okay, we're not allowed to go out today, but we have a lot of things to talk about. We had a lot of, we have a lot of maneuvers we need to go through still. So they were taken really serious and all the teams had meetings and made preparations, did some trimmings and uh, they did everything yesterday they could even though they weren't allowed on the water. Sorry, on board with the Danes, still in second place. And the Finns looking a little bit light there at the moment, but still in the lead overall, but only a lead of 100 meters over the Danes. And there's, there's a lot of people on board when you, when you look at it like that. But how, do you know how many it is, Suzanne, for these races? Is it, uh, is it 10? They have uh, 10 sailors on board each team, and uh, they are also uh, having some guests on board. Everyone is have, or supposed to have the same amount of guests, so I think everyone is having two VIPs or media persons on board as well. And, uh, I mean, this must be an enormous experience for, for, for the guests to be on board and feel the tension and hear how they communicate. I mean, being on board the Danish team, for example, and seeing these two blonde twins, it must be amazing. And I think it's, it's uh, now we're, we, had talking, we were talking about previously that uh, this Nordstrom race is connecting, uh, yeah, the Baltics through, for example, businesses. And I think as a, as a business person, you really can get a lot of, out of watching these sailors communicate, teamwork, uh, handle the stressful situations. And that's very useful uh, for companies to take that experience from the sports w into their own offices. And uh, yeah, I think it's very useful for them. So maybe stuff that we take for granted, but, but what kind of uh, communication skills do you think you develop through sailing? 
Uh, you will develop, uh, for example, this how to handle stress. Um, it doesn't look that stressful right now, but uh, being in the lead and having to defend your position could be something you, you could see in the business world as well. Um, and, uh, and how to communicate through a, a bunch of people here, 10 people, um, it's, it's very important. So the teamwork, you can see here how they are. Oh, the Danish just had attack there. Uh, so they were straightening out the baton in, in the top. Um, but you could see before, everyone is pointing, talking with each other. You have small teams on board of, uh, like these guys here in the back of the boat, they don't necessarily have the same topics as the ones in the front and the ones in the middle. So there's a lot of internal communication as well. Um, so it's kind of like in a, in a company, I would say. And, and on a boat this size as well, with that many people, the politics can build up as well if you're not careful. Like um, Often uh, the, the, the back of the boat where all the big decisions are being made, they can issue... Um, orders to the front of the boat without having fully explained what it is that they want the front of the boat to do. It's the front of the boat that tends to do the hard work, yes. the physical work. The back of the boat tends to do the thinking and the shouting. Yes, I know you're not. We're not allowed to swear, but but you say in Danish, the shit always moves forward, and on a boat it really does. <laughs> like if if something is is there's a problem, it will be in the end. Everything will end up in the front. Like they will have a hard job in in the bow if you if everything is not under control in the back of the boat, or if they are making a call too late, for example, to to take down the Jenneker or something like this. Um, so it is it is um, it's very important. And and again, as I said before, I think it's very useful for business people to come in on the boats and and watch this. And I know all over the world um, you can use sailing as a platform to train this. Um, and yeah, recruit uh, new people for your company and so on. So sailing is a very complex sport and, and I think um, has a lot of similarities to, to the business world. Yes, yes. And uh, I wonder what similarities it has of, um, of uh, starting a little bit too early over the line. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I don't know what parallel that we we can draw with business there, but uh, probably maybe launching your pro your product before you're ready for yes, <laughs> something like that. Yes, that's very good. That's yeah. very good. I think no, that's, but it that's is, spot on. It's when you're too eager. I mean, the Russians and also the Swedish were super eager, and they were just like, "Yeah, it's the first start, and we're so ready." And the Swedes were the first out of the harbor this morning, and you could just feel they were so ready and so happy to go racing, and probably they were a little bit too to a fan of it all when the start went off because they were right. over. Yeah. And on board uh, the Swedish boats, uh, they, their navigator or their tactician is uh, Sandra. Um, she, uh, she was on the, the, uh, the race for some of it last year, but is she doing all of it this year, do you know? Yes. She's actually the only female sailor in the Norton Race 2019 who will do everything like the whole race all the inshore races and all the offshore races um, so everything from Kiel to St. Petersburg and uh, she's also the tactician on board and yeah I had an, a nice chat with her yesterday and she said that because you can think like ah but come on she doesn't have the same amount of muscles and and she's not as strong as the guy she maybe hasn't got the same offshore experience but Sandra has actually she's one of the sailors with offshore experience on the Swedish team and uh, I mean, being a tactician, you don't need big muscles. You can just be, you need a really good brain muscle because you need to be super uh, good in, in getting the right calls for where to go. And uh, yeah, that will be her responsibility. And I know that the rest of the Swedish team has a huge respect for Sandra. She's one of the experienced uh, sailors on board. She's only, I think, 32 or something years old. But um, but yeah, a lot of the, the younger guys have are respecting her her skills a lot. Right, right. So, yeah. But there will be other female sailors joining. Um, I know the Swedish and I think also some of the other teams during the next couple of races or, or stopovers. So, yeah, that we will have more females. And in Stockholm, there will be a whole focus on, on the female sailors and trying to get them more into offshore racing because it's not... It's not, a, it's not been a big platform for, for, for women. We saw in the Volvo Ocean race... Um, not the, the latest one, but the, um, the one that was in 2015. Uh, we had a female project and they, I think they, the, their like, offshore experience was like what one person, the, the amount of total amount of offshore experience they had in their boat was the same in one, boat, in one guy's head. Wow. What he has experienced wow, in amazing. One of, yeah. So they are, I mean, women haven't got the same 
until so far they, there hasn't been the same opportunities. But I think like the Nordstrom race and other races, they're popping up the opportunities and, and yeah, it's just about getting into it. Well, one of the practical challenges on an on offshore boat is um, men and women living side by side with each other for days on end. Um, the, the, going to the loo, some of the basics of, of that and everyone sort of preserving their dignity, that's quite difficult sometimes, isn't it? I mean, just the practicalities of when a boat is bucking up and down in the waves, it's throwing people all around <laughs> the place and, and you're trying to go downstairs to go to the loo. I mean, just the practicalities, the, the simple things in life that we take for granted suddenly become a major mission. It's like climbing Everest all by itself, just going to the loo, isn't it? It is. And uh, like tomorrow, these sailors will head off to Copenhagen at four o'clock and, uh, and they will race the whole night. They won't sleep for a whole night. They will just be, you know, sailing. So, yeah, it is, it is different. It's very uh, demanding and, and uh, it's not like a, a normal, like day schedule they will have and the food they will eat out of a bag and you know it's it's kind of like uh, yeah as you said climbing Everest or something like that it it, it doesn't uh, it, it it doesn't really appeal that much I have to say I, I, I sometimes <laughs> wonder what, what we'll come back to that in a moment because I, I think we should just update you on, on what's going on in the race but there are other topics to dig into there um, but that's quite a nice shot there to to, to see uh, the Finns at the bottom of picture leading on port tack. And um, can you, Suzanne, see who the other boat is further at top of screen there? Um, might that be... It's not the Swedes, is it? No, um, actually, I must admit, I can't really see it out of the, the picture here. Maybe the Danes, but... Okay, so that, that, I've heard that is the, the, that is the Swedish boat, apparently. Okay, okay. So, so actually, the, the distance... For, Front to back. Okay, there, there's the there's the 3D image. Actually, it makes me wonder if that other boat we were looking at was the Danes. Anyway, um, the the Finns are still leading, and the boat speed still hanging around the sort of the seven knot mark. And it it looks like the Finns are, are, are very much the same speed, if not the fastest boat on the water. So as you said about 10 minutes ago, Suzanne, maybe they were sailing into the light patch sooner, but maybe they're coming out of the light patch into better breeze sooner than other people as well. So the Finns potentially have a chance of stretching their lead a little bit here. Yeah, they're, they're looking very strong, and uh, it's it's going to be exciting to see how Germany is going to end up after because they went out to the other side and I think they uh, they were quite lonely out there. So, uh, but uh, yeah, on their speed they're looking okay, stable compared to the others as well. So, but it's yeah, it's always exciting with splits, but it's also uh, risky from from the Germans um, because they they still have two boats behind them that they will have to defend. But of course they're hunting for better, so they want to beat the Danes and, and the Russian or the Finnish in front of them. So. But it, in in terms of hunting for better, it looks like if anything that gamble hasn't worked out and no. the, the Germans are are more in danger of being swallowed up by fourth and fifth place by the Russians and the uh, the Swedes. So um, the Finns really have stretched their legs. Their, their lead was down to 100 meters 10 minutes ago. Now it's up to more than 200 meters. Um, the Danes look fairly secure in second place at the moment, and the Germans in danger of being caught by the Russians and the Swedes. Yeah, that is the situation right now. And, um, and yeah, I, we talked about it earlier on as well, that it looked as if there was a little bit more of... Uh, of breeze to the right, where the Danish went as one of the first boats, and I think that that's what how they also gained more and more, and uh, and now are on a clear second spot compared to they took over the the Germans with a lot, um, but the Finnish are really really strong. Um, there we can see here how big a lead they have, and they were nervous before as we talked about, but it it turned out well when they when they were looking for wind and and uh, probably trimming um, a little bit differently. It's in this. Winds, it's a lot about changing gears all the time. So preparing yourself, if the wind will go up, you have to trim, you have to trim the body weight, the sails, um, everything. And if, if the wind drops, uh, you have to do the exact same. So that was probably what we saw that the Finnish were, were doing there in the picture now. And now they look as if they have the breeze on again, more people over the side and, and yeah. And that overhead shot was really interesting to see how little wake, how little the... Uh the boat disturbs the water. It's got the uh, the motor rib, much smaller boat next to the fins. 
um, but kicking up a lot more wake. So you can see that there, the, the boat on the right, um, probably the boat where one of our cameras is, yes. is situated, kicking up so much more wake. Um, and, and the water looks so clean behind the, um, the sailing boat, behind the Club Swan 50. Yeah, it's just great design and, and, uh, and they're really, yeah, as we talked about before, they're light uh, boats and, and uh, they're really going well. I've sailed them once and, and they're, uh, they feel so nice too. Like, actually, we talked about it earlier that the, that the J70s, the boats that they actually qualified to be able to participate in the Nordstrom race, that to qualify in the J70s, this just looks like a big J70. Like, it's sportive, it's a, a big cockpit, it's all the design of it, it's very modern and a lot of carbon fiber. And yeah, so it is kind of like a, a grown-up uh, J70, uh, this uh, Club Swan 50, I would say. The Club Swan 50 made uh, in Finland by Nautor Swan, but designed by an Argentinian designer, Juan Kumajan, mm -hmm. um, who designed some of the fastest Volvo 70s that uh, won a number of Volvo Ocean races. And, and this Club Swan 50, it looks like a baby Volvo 70, yeah. doesn't it? Very, yeah. very angular, uh, very wide at the back, very narrow at the, at the bow. It's, it's like a, a, a big triangular wedge, um, very powerful aft sections that make it very, very fast downwind. Exactly. And, and uh, yeah, it is kind of like a, a red thread between these boats, uh, the J70s, the Club 150s and the Volvo boats. Um, they are like racing machines and amazing for sailors to race because you have such a good work spot and you, yeah, they're more yeah they're easier to control and uh, and yeah but not that comfortable downstairs we talked about earlier what they're doing how they're living their lives and and downstairs is just ripped it's literally nothing downstairs if you as a private person buy a club 150 you get couches and uh, a toilet and stuff like that a nice little kitchen down here in these uh Nord Stream race club 150s they're ripped there's nothing there's not even a mattress or anything it's just sails and equipment and yeah their gear so and um when they're out at sea on the offshore races they go into a watch system is that right so um not everyone is sailing the boat all at once because you have to get some sleep at some point yeah it depends because the shift we have the first leg we have that is uh, going to be from Kiel to Copenhagen will only it they will start tomorrow at 4 and they think they'll be in Copenhagen somewhere Monday morning which means that they will not have like they will they will not they, they they're okay with jumping one night of sleep maybe they'll get a couple of hours here and there but they'll have a shift anyway because you cannot stay focused for that many hours and, uh, and you need to so you, the helmsmen, for example, they change and the trimmers, they will change a little bit all the time to be sure that you can have a little bit of rest. Think about, or you're not thinking about that much else, but I think just, you know, maybe have a little bit of food and, uh, and uh, just go somewhere else on the boat so you have your head fresh when you are going to go back on your position again. But of course, the leg between Copenhagen and Stockholm, you need to do these shifts and... Uh, I don't know how these teams are doing it individually, but the smartest way that you can do it and the way they're doing it in the, in the ocean racing is, um, in the Volvo Ocean Race, is that you have typically four hour shifts. So you are on for four hours and then you're off for four hours, on for four hours and then like this. So yeah, the, then when you do long races, like for example, from Kiel, uh, from uh, Copenhagen to Stockholm, you will be challenged in the sleep because, uh, yeah, it's going to be a race for two, three days, something like that. And then you're going to you're going to need more than just the, yeah, a couple of hours here in their sleep. But they're super tired when they come into the finish line in Stockholm. Um, but yeah, this shift system is, is keeping them alive through the race. Mm. Now, the timing of this race, the Nord Stream race, we are, we're coming up to the, this is the eighth edition. Is that correct? Yes. Um, so, so previously the Nord Stream race started later in the year um, and uh, you wouldn't have had this whole multitude of boats out on the water in some of those previous editions. We're seeing so many boats out on the water and, and the amount of traffic that uh, the people like the Danes have to sail <laughs> through right now. You, you can get some sense of, of why the timing of the Nord Stream race has changed to coincide with Kiel Week. I mean, it's just a fantastic time of year to be here, to, to be surrounded by so many other people who love this sport. Yes, um, Kiel Week is one of the 
the great events, but Nordstrom Race will also take part of a big event in Stockholm, where it's the OF Offshore Race, um, where it's something similar like the Kiel Week, just a little bit smaller, but it's a start also for an offshore event in uh, in KSSS, in this Royal Swedish Yacht Club. Um, so there, there will be a lot of uh, boats as well, and you almost see the similar pictures going out of the... Um, Archipelago in in um, in Stockholm. You see all these boats, and uh, yeah, it's it's great that the Nordstrom race has combined their race uh, with uh, with these two big events because it it makes more um, live on shore and and things uh, yeah to to watch. Oh, we have a little so, bit of VIPs here in the picture. <laughs> yes, so that that is uh, Chancellor Schroeder. Uh, the former Prime Minister of Germany, enjoying his ride at the back of a Club Swan 50 today and enjoying everything that there is to see and uh, experience out there in uh, Kiel Bay today. It must be one of the busiest days of the year. It's just such a celebration of sail out there today. Um, so uh, a proud moment for uh, former Chancellor Schroeder and all the other Germans on board the uh, Norddeutsche Regatta Verein boat to, uh, to be sailing out of Kiel's city centre and uh, through all these amazing number of boats that we're seeing out on the water today. Uh, attack just coming in there. Can you see who that is that's just gone on to starboard attack, Suzanne? I can't tell from here. I think it's the Russians maybe, but I'm not 100% sure. We have to see in a bit when they come more clearly into the picture. And cutting their way between two other boats. So that goes to show... Uh, is that the Russians? I still can't tell. Um, I think it's, it might be the Swedes, actually. Um, yeah, it probably is the, the guys we have here in the picture now. Um, so yeah. th there's a, a real battle for third, fourth, and fifth. And unfortunately for the Germans, they have they rather... part of this, yes. <laughs> yeah, they've been swallowed up, haven't they? Yeah, they have. Um, they, they took a little bit of risky call there on the left side on their own. And probably they had less wind out there. Um, and, yeah, the, the Swedes and the Russians were able to, to catch up, and that's, of course, their goal. Um, oh, yeah, of course, that's their goal to, to catch up on, on uh, because after this bad start where they had to go across the start line again, uh, that was a tough one. So, of course, they, they are into trying to hunt for the rest of the sailors now. Yes, absolutely. But uh, we have, in the Nordstrom race, we have... Uh, these are the inshore races that we're watching right now. We'll have two more this afternoon. But the Nordstrom race also has uh, some offshore races, as we talked about before. And the Nordstrom race has three trophies. They have one trophy that is for the offshore race. So counting all the four legs. So Copenhagen, uh, Kiel to Copenhagen, Copenhagen to Stockholm, Stockholm to Helsinki, and then the final one, uh, Helsinki to St. Petersburg. So that's the overall... Uh, offshore trophy. Then we have the inshore uh, trophy, which is races like this, all the ones combined in all the stopovers, and then the two of them combined, the offshore and the inshore. And the Swedes really attacking uh, the Germans. The Germans on starboard tack sailing towards the left, just seeing the cross now between Sweden and Germany. So Germany still ahead, but uh, Sweden certainly on the attack and uh, their tactician, Sandra, making some strong calls as the, it seems like we're going through the narrowest stretch of water right now. So, yes, um, we'll have some action now, I think, uh, Andy, actually, with the tacking and it will be, uh, it will be beautiful to watch. And, and I think it's a little bit funny that uh, this picture of the Germans and the Swedish just reminded me a little bit of mat tracing, actually. They were so close and, uh, and the German skipper, Sven Eik Horsch, he is actually a former mat racing sailor of Germany. And, um, yeah, he's taken away a lot of titles previously. And, uh, yeah, it's he. But, yeah, he's not really doing any match racing right now. He's not tagging back on the Swedes. I would love to see that. But, yeah, he's, of course, he's, oh, maybe it's coming there. Uh, yeah, it looks yeah, like it the Germans are just tagging. Oh, maybe he so heard what I said. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, and bit, bit of outside assistance. Are, this is a classic match racing situation where you're kind of like having a tagging duel. Um, so, yeah, it's almost a tacking duel here between the, the Swedish and, and the Germans. Oh, and it, 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 yeah, it looks very tight with the, uh, the Russians, Russians as well. well. So uh, things really closing up between these three boats right now. Yeah, that's, that's going to be exciting to watch because is, uh, it is ain't Germany going to be able to cross? I mean, Germany's on port tack. It's going to have to give way. So does Germany think it's going to be able to cross 
the Swedes, it looks close at the moment. Yes, it and does, the Germans, definitely. no, they can't. So, so the Germans now, I think, are going to be overtaken for third place by the Swedes. Yeah. I, I know it's easy to sound clever here on the camera, or like behind the camera, but uh, this is what we're talking about e uh, earlier, that the Germans have taken some risks on their own side before. And now, uh, yeah, again, the Swedes have won on the right side. So uh, it was a little bit risky of them not to... If they would have been a little bit quicker in the match race moves, they could have, like, come back uh, to, to the right side quicker. But, yeah, now it looks as if they lost uh, this, the Swedish boat. And even on the scoreboard... In the top left corner, we see the Swedes now in the third place. So Sandra Sandquist, she was talking through some very quick tacks. That was three quick tacks uh, very close together, which you don't always want to tack that often because every maneuver slows the boat down. You want to keep on going in a straight line to keep the boat going at top speed. But in tactical terms, she's sailed a fantastic race for the last two or three minutes. It's moved the yeah. Swedes up into third place. Yeah, and she comes from smaller boats. Um, uh, previously, she's done Olympic racing and, and other racing. And I think if, when you come from the smaller boats, you have tendencies to be like more open-minded for tacking and maneuvers in general because uh, it's a big boat to maneuver around. A lot of people you have to move. But I think Sandra, she's just like, let's go for it. Come on, uh, we, uh, we need to do a tack. So I think she's quite into uh, trying to to see whatever she can do to get the tax in. And, and if you do a right tack in these conditions, you can get the speed up quite fast again. So I think, um, yeah, you, if you do them right, of course. So, yeah. and, uh, but I think, again, this Swedish team is almost the same crew as they had last year. And I think uh, they're uh, one of the experienced team because the Germans and the Swedes are the only ones who have the, the same skipper as last year. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, there are some of the... The, the teams that then actually can say that they have had some hours in the clubs 150s. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, well, that, maybe that's one of the differences with these tacks because getting these maneuvers right, uh, especially if you've only had two days practice in the boat, never sailed a clubs 150 before, it's a little bit intimidating going straight into these fast maneuvers, especially with hundreds of other boats around you that you've also got to stop from hitting as well. Yes. I mean, quite apart from worrying about the other four boats that, that are in the same race as you, a lot of your tactics are dictated by where the other boats are that have nothing to do with the race. Yeah, yeah. there's, uh, there's a lot of things to, to keep an eye on. And, uh, and yeah, here we see, oh, they want to... Waving oh, at the camera? Yeah, at us. They're waving at <laughs> us. Go out of our way. Um, no, but they probably felt as if they were a little bit close. And their wave can be, the, from the media boat, can be a little bit annoying uh, if... I would say that's, that'd be giving them a shove from there, yeah, wouldn't it? Nah, it, it can. It, maybe these boats are too big, but at least in the Olympic um, classes, it's, it's something. This 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 wave from behind the media boat can actually be a like a stopping wave, so they can't get past it. I think the clubs 150s are bigger than that, but yes. uh, maybe that's what they were thinking. Like, get out of our way. Maybe they had a little header in front of them, so they fell. Ah. Oh, we just well, got info here. So uh, apparently they, they had to avoid uh, another boat. They were looking for some uh, room, room to be two. able to manoeuvre. Yeah. Great. Uh, and it's, um, according to our stats at the moment, the Germans may have moved back up into third. So um, still very close between Sweden and Germany and Russia not very far behind either. But so, again, a split, I think. I it looks like it, doesn't it? Yeah, it looks as if at least the Germans are very alone on, on their side. And yeah, it's, um, they're taking some risks today, but right now it looks as if it's paying off because they're back up in third again. But yeah. On board with the Danes. More Peter quiet. Peter Vara at the helm. Did you say more quiet? I think this more, looks more quiet. We don't have an, an, <laughs> like a Duracell a twin jumping around <laughs> in the cockpit right now. Uh, so they're probably quite happy about their where they're heading right now, and you can... You, you think the less the Duracell twin is jumping around, the, the, <laughs> the better the situation? Yeah, then there's more control over the situation. And, and right. uh, Yeah, they said to me this morning that a lot of it is depending on us, and, uh, and I talked with Peter yesterday. He said that these two guys are amazing. They are just... Uh, they're really good in, in, in helping the whole team, and uh, yeah, I... They, their team spirit seems really good on the Danish team. I also understand Danish, of course, so I can understand what they're talking about. And uh, they seem as if they're happy and, you know, energized. And, yeah, so it's, um, it's been great to witness this guy. You can see one of the twins there. 
uh, in the picture in, with the blonde hair. Yes, it looks as if they're going to make ready for attack. And you're spot on as they go into attack. But meanwhile, well, there, there are the Danes. They've completed that attack. Still looking ahead, still seeing what opportunities they have to be able to try and seize the lead from the Finns, from Orlanska, Segel, Salskapet, who uh, were one of the two leaders off the start line and no one's managed to get ahead of them yet. This picture just, I know we've been <laughs> talking a lot about these twins, but look at them. These are the guys running the boat. We have they, the, with the blonde hair. It's, it's like I've uh, got blurred vision. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Absolute yeah, you, spitting you image were, of each other. If you're talking with them, you would feel like this with the with just the hearing because they're they're also talking all the time. They're finishing each other's sentences, and they're a great team. And it must be a real uh, gift for for the Danish uh, to have them on board their team. But I wonder if the if their uh, crewmates can actually tell one apart from the other if they know who they're talking to. Uh, yeah, I don't know. They are, their nicknames is LP and HC, so they are quite... Uh, yeah, so you just sometimes mumble something like... Rrr, 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 and then one of them is like, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, but, uh, but I think they can. They have a little bit of a, a difference in their face. And, but I still have problems with it. And I've known them since they were like seven years old or something. So I still have problems uh, right. setting them apart. They're super alike. It's great and to hear some sound, actually. I, yes. I love that. It's, uh, you can hear the interaction. And, and uh, I don't really see any VIP on this boat right now, but they must be sitting somewhere else. And I was at the skipper's briefing yesterday, and the sailors were asking about that. Can we put the VIPs wherever we want? And uh, the answer was yes. You're not allowed to have them participating in the race, so they're not allowed to. You would not see Gerhard Schröder uh, go down and uh, trim the, the jeep or anything. That's not allowed. But... Um, but you're allowed to take them like now where we see them sitting with their backs uh, there behind uh, in the picture with their legs over the, the edge. They You're allowed to bring the VIPs up there. Okay. Um, yeah. And I hope the sailors have time to actually explain what's going on because it must be, if you haven't tried sailing before, it must be a little bit like, why are we tacking so much and why can't we just sail why can't we go in a straight line? Yes, exactly. And I hope the sailors are good at, at explaining Why this. Why can't we go in a straight line? Well, you just can't. It's... Um... Oh, come on. <laughs> no, it's... Uh, it's yeah, you have to have... A, you, these boats have probably a taking angle of, I think... <laughs> okay, we're in German we're just, now. <laughs> we're just hearing sirens in the background and wondering what that is. It's sirens warning of the impending arrival of five clubs 150s. Yes, Oh, um, it just turned off again. <laughs> Let's hope it's not <laughs> war coming. Um, but, but anyway, no, I mean, you, you can't sail a boat straight into the wind, can you? So, no, no, you, you, so you need to be, you need to have a, an angle to the wind of approximately 40 degrees, something like this. I think these boats are, are designed for. And um, yeah, so, and then you tack. So you kind of like, if you go down, um, like on a hill skiing, you also don't take it straight down. You also take it into zigzags. Okay. And the same is um, with alpine skiing. The same is then with the sailing. You, when you go upwind, you need to do these zigzagging towards the top mark. Okay. So, yeah. And, and what's that line uh, dragging along in the water? It looks like a frog's water skiing off the, yes. the, the boat or it's something. It's not really on purpose, I think. Uh, it's probably one of the Jenneker lines or something that's not being pulled incorrectly. But it's, it will slow them down maybe 0.0. .0 not or something, I uh, zero, zero point something not. It's not very, very important, but I, as a sailor, I don't like this. I think it's, um, yeah, it's just, you have to pull things like this in. And But they have a lot of things to think about. Tax, how many tax have we seen of the Danish the last couple of minutes? So it's probably not their first priority right now, but yeah. And you can see just how wide side to side the split is between the back four boats. Uh, the Finns still well out by themselves, top of picture. But then on the far left, we've got Sweden. In the middle, we've got Russia. And then on the right-hand side, we've got the Danes and Germany. And uh, the Danes have really dropped way back, actually. Look, the Danes are, have, have fallen back into this race for second to fifth place. So uh, these extra attacks that the Danes have put in... Uh, uh, let's see, I, I, I'm, uh -huh. I'm trying to work it... Oh. Ooh, oh, we have I'm, some love here on the... <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure that Chancellor Schroeder's really concentrating on the race. He seems to have other things to do. 
I must, I actually, there's also one of the slogans is connecting Baltics through love. And maybe this is the situation they are. Right. Well, yes. no, no better advert for <laughs> no, that than what we exactly. just saw. So uh, this is actually, it's great that they have time for, for a little kiss here in, in, the, in this, yeah, tagging duel that the Germans have going on who, right now. Who cares if you're dropping down the fleet if you've got love? Exactly. I mean, what else matters? Yeah. Because um, the Germans are, 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 are definitely um, struggling in that pack. Um, but uh, anyway, it, good to see that uh, the former Chancellor is having a good day yeah. out on the water today. Yes, and it's beautiful. The sun is shining, and that's a thing you have to appreciate here in Kiel. Uh, I've, been, I've been here in Kiel week maybe 10 times or something, and I've I've not seen the sun out that much, I would say, <laughs> previously. So this is an amazing day. And look at all of these boats. And uh, it must be great for them to actually be a part of it, uh, Gerhard Schröder. And, and I think it must be his partner we saw there. Um, so, yeah. But I, I'm actually looking forward to see the boat coming out now because soon they have to uh, come through some, some red marks, um, which is the next up... Um, yeah, for for the, in the on the race course, and uh, it's going to be uh, exciting because now we have the Russians on the third place in the graphics. But yeah, it's it's. I think it's going to be exciting when they actually get there because even though it, they might not look as if they look, they are so close to each other. I think it will be quite close when they get to to the next marks. Um, sometimes the uh, the graphics can can uh, yeah. And the, the uh, Danes on the right of picture, you can see that so much traffic they've got to get through there, just going past one of the tool ships. And I can't <laughs> help wondering that one of the, that, that tool ship on the right-hand side of the screen is going to cause some kind of wind shadow for the Danes as they go past it. Um, I would like to hear what the Danish had to say about that, the two energized twins. Uh, uh, yes. They were not, yes. probably not being so happy about it, but the Danes look quite strong right now and uh, if you look in the top of the screen where in, in like in the horizon there's more wind uh, to come so i think it's just about surviving through these uh, tall ships and other uh, obstacles and then getting out to to the wind and i think we'll see in a uh, higher boat speed from there well they seem to have about half a knot extra boat speed compared with the leaders the fins mm. um so again maybe maybe like you were saying half an hour earlier the the wind is pulsing it's going up and down and yeah. Maybe the leaders are sailing into another light patch. But no, and now, as I say that, uh, the, the, the boat speed of the first two boats is actually very similar now, just over six knots. And uh, no one has managed to pick up those sheets. They're, they're <laughs> out of the water at the moment because they're on starboard tack. But when they tack, they're going to be dragging those sheets through the water again so someone's not paying attention on board no and and like now it's it's far from being this dramatic but if you are slagging on this a lot and for a whole offshore race for example it might come under the rudder something like this so it is very important to uh, to have a clean boat uh, to work with and and not having sheets in in the water that's a good point because uh, w this is a twin rudder boat so uh, especially when the boat leans over more than it is now the windward rudder tends tends to uh, come out of the water completely. I would, I would imagine that those rudders, when they're out of the water, are quite good at snagging loose sheets. Yes, yes. I th and there's more time for that as well. And we were, as we can see, the Germans have now overtaken the Danes. And uh, yeah, you, I, I don't think really, from his body language, I would say one of the blonde twins doesn't really look that happy there in the back. And you can see they're, they're looking around. And as you said before, Andy, we had this tall ship taking their wind. I, oh, and you can see the boat is more bumping. Um, they probably have some chop there from all the traffic. So I think that, that it is, um, yeah, I think it's hard racing out there right now. And, and I think an indication of how this, how the, ten, like the focus is on board is their body language before we had a lot of sailors standing up again. They're not satisfied. They need more wind. They need to trim something differently. And that's why a lot of people are, are standing up in, in the Danish boat right now. That's interesting that you can sort of t tell what the mood is by the body language. I mean, surely if you, if you were the ultimate machines, the ultimate um, sailing robots, you'd never be able to tell the difference between whether a team was winning or losing. They'd always look the same, wouldn't they? Yeah, I, I don't know. It's just, it's, it was... It was clearly to see here on the Danish uh, guys that they were not happy about the situation. And, but actually, you should try to stay low. You should try to remember these things. But that's, 
that's the stressful situation that they're in right now. And then you're, they're trying to oof, see if they can change it. And uh, yeah, the, typically you stand up to see what's the opportunity with the winds. Do we have to trim something differently? And yeah. It, it looks pretty light from that angle. I don't know if that's just the angle that we're getting from the drone, but um, it looks like there's not a lot of wind for the Danes to play with there right now. No, I, I agree with you. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it could be... Well, look at the gap as well. I mean, they, they, were, in the, they were in second place just, mm -hmm. what, two or three minutes ago, and now the Germans are more than 100 meters in front of them. So something's going badly wrong for the Danes right now. Yes, and I don't know if it's something better out there on the right side because the Swedes, when they had the tacking duel with the Germans before, we saw that the Swedes, Swedes were winning a little bit on the right, and I think the Germans are on the right side now. Um, so maybe the wind might be a little bit stronger to that side. It's difficult for us to say here on, on the screen, but but uh, yeah, it is... Um, well, it seems like the, the boats we're looking at now are in better wind yes, than what exactly. the Danes are in. But you look beyond them towards the shore, and it looks like there's a real light patch there, and unless that's a shallow spot, and it's all a bit deceptive with the, with the, with the different depths of water. But um, it, it does seem like the leaders, the, the Finns and, and the Germans, have better breeze than the Danes, who are sort of beneath our picture, if you know what I mean. Yes, exactly. So this, this right side for, for the sailors have, have definitely... Or it looks for us as if it's been definitely better. So here we're getting some in the picture, some sailors. I think it was the Finnish ones heading out here of the, the bay, as we can see, or the, the Kila Canal towards the Kina, out here uh, to Schiltsee, where we are. Yes, that's right. Um, so uh, they're probably, I would guess, they maybe just past the halfway stage of the race now. And they're just coming into view of where we are in our commentary position. But still some miles offshore from where we are. But the Danes are closest to our commentary position. The Finns further towards the, uh, the shore on the far side of Keel Bay. But the, the, uh, the Swiss are now way, sorry, Swedish are way, way, way <laughs> at the like, back. I was like, what? Did sorry. they join the Nazi race? <laughs> <laughs> Mixing my flags up. No, no, um, it's okay. But uh, no, the, the Swedish have gone badly wrong somewhere because they are now more than 200 meters behind the Russians. And you, th you think that the, uh, the, the Swedes were racing with the Germans not so long ago and, and something strange has happened to them in a very short space of time. Yeah, it's, uh, and the Russian has, has done a great job lately catching up where they're actually almost, or they're close to the third spot now. So it's, it is... It's actually going to be quite exciting this last uh, beat out of um, towards the finish line because it's um, yeah it's you can see here even on the graphics they're not that far apart I know it's uh, it's 300 meters but uh, from 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 the first to the last approximately but uh, yeah it's it's going to be uh, there's still a lot of racing to do in he ahead of them and and they they need to. Focus, but the finish, I must say, I, I want to give them some credit and say they've done a great job. It's not easy leading in these light conditions. Um, you might think it's easier because, ah, come on, uh, they're in front, they can just. But when people split behind them, we've seen that a lot. It's, oh, should we follow the uh, one team or the other one? And they have just followed their heart, and and uh, and and as, yeah, it looks as if it, it has paid off for them to have great tactics. Uh, no one has really managed to threaten them yet, have they? I mean, they, they've. Uh, really look quite strong throughout, whereas the, all the other four have been changing places on a regular basis. Yes, true. And, and they're having this stable uh, lead of uh, approximately 250 meters, um, which shows that, yeah, they're, they're having a little bit their own race there in the front of the course, and then the rest of them are having their own party. Um, but yeah, it's... Um, and here again, you can see that they're pretty happy. Again, body language, right, Andy? Uh, you can see that they're more calm in the boat, sitting down. Um, and yeah. I, I think they're sitting further forwards as well. We see more yes. people up, up front in front of the mast. So the trim on this boat seems to be more bow forwards than some of the other teams. Yes, and I think we actually see two VIPs there on, on deck as well, um, with the light blue caps on. And, so uh, no kissing for them at the back of the boat. Not they... yet, maybe <laughs> they will <laughs> maybe have a kiss here. But yeah, it's. I think that they are uh, VIPs as well, and and I would say it's wise to put them there in 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 the front in these little bit lighter conditions. And yeah, 
Yeah, they're even involved a little bit. Oh, they're listening. Is there going to happen something soon? It looks as if they're actually thinking about tech. And you can see that the tactician who was sitting with the iPad next to the VIPs, he was talking to the back of the boat. Yeah, do, um, are they? Are they uh, the guys at the front are just having a doze, <laughs> and why not? It's, it's a lovely day for a bit of sunbathing, isn't it? Oh, yeah, exactly. I mean, they're leading. What do they got to worry about? <laughs> yeah, no. I think it's uh, partly with the wind draft, but it's also because it's more comfortable like this. And uh, <laughs> yeah. But they um, look really, I must say, their, their body langu language shows that they are happy in their position. They, they like the trim of the boat. And um, yeah. And they did a great job so far. And that pole sticking out the front of the boat, what's that for? Yeah, it, what is it? I, it looks like a, a toothstick or something. No, it, it does, it, doesn't it? Yeah, it's, uh, it's for the Jenneker, the, the asymmetrical spinnaker that these boats have um, to get it more away from the boat. You can also have it hoist one without, but it's way better with this uh, bowsprit in, in the front. And um, yeah, but the, some, in the J70s, as we have been talking about before, you can actually pull it out and in again. But in, on these boats, they are permanent out there and super strong. So, so that's f flying the Jenica, which is the biggest sail on the boat. But they're not using it today because this is an upwind race. And yes, we might see it later or we will see it later in, in the next inshore races because then they will have um, more up and down. So it will be wind from coming from uh, first in the from the front of the boat and then in the end from the in the back of the boat. Or, and that's when they will hoist it um, So we're at quarter past 12 now, and we've still probably got, I would say, at least another half hour of this race to do. Um, and then there's a brief gap, and then we've got two more races, what we call windward lured races, starting at 2 o'clock this afternoon. Yes. And they should last for, what, about 45 minutes each? Mm -hmm. Yes, something like that. And... Um They'll uh, be more hectic than this race, won't yes, they? Yes, it more will maneuvers. be. Yes, it will be more like a normal up-down course, as we call it, where you have a regular start line and then you have to go around the course up and down for a couple of loops. We'll, of course, talk more about that later. But, um, yeah, more action, more maneuvers and um, more tight racing. So, yeah, looks as if this team is making ready for attack shortly. The VIP's got the legs of the side what do you think Andy do you agree with me or <laughs> there, there's they're certainly ready to move if they need to and and a couple of people rolling in off the bow but no that's that's just to have a have a look around the front of the jib so I think something oh, yeah. will happen now soon I think it's very wise of them to give the VIPs a lot of time <laughs> yes. like, to get the legs in because it's uh, it's not allowed to be stressful for them of course and no. um now we can see this beautiful tech and the teamwork here. And the team crossing sides to the new windward side of the boat, the new high side of the boat, now that the boat has tacked. And the VIPs getting back <laughs> into their position with the legs over the side. Yeah, maybe they're not that satisfied. They're jiving into or attacking into a, a more shadow position now. For <laughs> But maybe it's so hot uh, not, out there. Not so, so. not so good for the sunshine. No, exactly. No. The... It's actually, we're, we're out of the sunshine here. It's actually pretty chilly out of the sun, isn't it? Yeah, it is actually. Um, but uh, the sailors, as we can see here, we have uh, our view from here is all these uh, 29er sails. And what do we have more? 505 and lasers and everything. They're all enjoying Flying the sun. Flying Dutchman, one yes. of the old Olympic classes. But basically dinghies for either one or two people. Loads and loads of them. I mean, just hundreds of boats right next to us. And they're about to go out there and make this busy part of water even busier yes. than it is now yeah we will be i think we'll see them in in a couple of hours as well in the intro races we'll have them everywhere around us um so yeah it's a great sailing festival down here it's that's for sure it's a great sailing outing for the Finns, who continue to lead this race very comfortably um and uh it looks like the swedes are up into third place again i don't know if that's really the case because they were quite far back uh, just not very long ago, but we've seen things changing quite quickly between the back four in this race behind the leader. It's really only the Finns that have managed to hold their position. The other four are bouncing all over the place on the leaderboard. 
and the, the Danes that were struggling just 10 minutes to go on one uh, far out to one side of the track. Uh, they got a good boat speed and, uh, well, there's still 80 meters behind the Germans, but that's, that's better than uh, the 150 meters that they were behind the Germans. So the Danes coming back and starting to attack for second place again. And if it is the Nordstrom race we have there to the right, we will have a, I think it looks as if we'll have a... Port Starboard, if, yeah. if, if that is, it's, it's hard to tell. Um, but the the, uh, the the Duracell bunnies aren't looking that animated at the moment. So. No, exactly. So I think it's a, it's a calm situation. It might be even on the same, yeah, it's on the same tech. Uh, they were just going fast, the Danes. So, uh, so I think... Um, yeah, it looks pretty good for the Danes right now. And, and these pictures, so even though it's, it, it's around 200 meters uh, from, the, from the finish to the, to the second spot for the Germans, it's, it's quite close here on these pictures. And uh, yeah, it ain't over until the fat lady sings, don't you say that, Andy? Uh, yes, <laughs> In yes, your country? We, yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, so yeah, it's going to be very um, important these last... Um, decisions because uh, I think where they're around now on, on the on the course is uh, they have two red like uh, I think they're called trade route marks or something uh, that they're cro that they're around now and then they have to go to the the finish line which will be outside here where we are in in Schilksi. so um, there's still a little bit of racing left but they are but it and this will be very important there's more open waters here and if you yeah, the wind can probably pick up a little bit now they, they get out into more free waters and, and f away from shore. There's the Germans, and at the back is Chancellor Schroeder and his special friend, the two VIPs on board the German boat. And in the back of the boat we see this tall ship. What a contrast, right? Yes, <laughs> but... Uh, Maybe they share some kind of heritage. Um, maybe the tall ship in its day was the Club's 150 of its day. Look, and it even has a bowsprit as well yes. <laughs> in the front of, uh, of the boat. And, nice, um, nice shot by the camera there to yes. capture two bowsprits right, right next to each other. Definitely. And I think the German teams look... Uh, the German team, again, I'm, I'm talking about the body language. We don't have any down on, on the boat so we have to guess here um, and um, but I think they look quite happy in their position now now that maybe they're gonna make ready for some no they're, they're moving their body weight forward uh, as we talked about that's a trimming possibility so that suggests the wind is dropping a little bit and coming down the further forwards they move in the boat the less wind there is yes yes so um Oh, wow, and the other pictures. boat that's that's gone behind the tall ship, that's got to be a bit of a loss in terms of losing um, out on the wind shadow of that tall ship. I might even think that's the Danes who they're battling against. Or maybe not. Oh, I no, so I think that might be the Russians that down the, the lured boat. Now we're on board with the Danes and this is the other side of the tall ship. So the, the Danes trying to get across the front of this tall ship. Will they be able to do that? Is that the tooting we hear, you think? Are they going to say, like, <laughs> get out of our way? At least there's some talking on the Danish team. They think they need, a, they need to do something. Oh, there's some... I love that we can hear these Danish guys. They're, They're the <laughs> only ones that we yeah. can hear. <laughs> um, I'm not sure what they're trying to say there. I think they were not super satisfied about the fact that they had to tack. But well, surely you you have to accept that the tall ship is is one of the obstructions out there. Yeah, and it you... is a, a welcome race, and and these sailors are aiming for the win, and they're professionals. But uh, this is a part of the show, and uh, yeah, this is uh, the next couple of races. They will have more of their own course without tall ships and other things. And you get the impression that the Danes have been forced out to the left-hand side to a place they don't really want to be. No, exactly. Uh, and, and so there, there's enforced leverage coming in here. Now, if they're lucky, um, then maybe the wind will come in from the left-hand side and it will do them a favor. But you get the impression that they're being forced out to a side of the course they don't really want to go. Yes, and it also looks as if it gives the Russians a chance of, of 
hunting them even better. They're very close now on this leaderboard. Yes, could change any moment, couldn't it? Yeah, it could actually. So it's going to be very vital for the Danes how they're going to, uh, yeah, tackle this next couple of. Uh, of meters in front of them because maybe they want to go back but it's also expensive doing all these maneuvers as we talked about before and yeah it's um gonna be exciting to see how the danish will will handle this and some of these other boats that the club's 150s are going past absolutely swallowing them up going much faster and uh gonna the club's 150 is going to give quite a bit of wind shadow to some of these other boats now, I wonder who that is attacking there. Was it? Could be the Swedes, but I can't tell for sure. No, I th yeah, it could be the Swedes. Here we have the, the Germans who, yeah, we were a little bit surprised about their split early on in, in, in the Bay of Kiel or in, yeah, and now they are actually, uh, they've done a great job here the, the last uh, half an hour and uh, are now on, on the second spot. And it looks as if the, the Danes have lost their third spot now to the Russians, okay. as we talked about before. It was yes. only a couple of meters. Um, and now, actually, the Russians are in front of the Danes. Expensive for the Danes to meet that tall ship. And they had to tack. But, um, but it, it looks like that tall ship, which is actually motoring, along with that big um, container uh, ship or oil tank or whatever that is, there's a lot of traffic here. The Russians are going to end up the wrong side of that oil tanker, and I think the Germans will as well. So the Germans might even be forced to tack away by the tanker. So th this shows you just how challenging it is out here. There's so many unpredictable things. Yes. Uh, who, who's to know exactly where that tall ship is aiming? Where is that tanker aiming? I, I can't help thinking that tall ship could do the, the race a favor by just slowing down and and just uh, staying out of trouble a little bit more. Um, I mean, I think maybe that's what the, uh, the, the Duracell bunnies were getting animated about, yes. Yes. was uh, can't you just keep out of the way? Can't you see we've got a race going on here? But, you know, being able to um, adjust to changes is one of the most important things in sailing. Uh, we talked about it uh, previously about coming from the J-70s into the Swan, that's a change. Uh, we, we talked about that you go from inshore races to offshore races all the time in the Northern race, that's changes you have to adjust to. Um, you get more wind, less wind, that's like on short term, super many changes you need to do on a day. And this is also a change you need to take into consideration and into your plannings and you just need to swallow it, you know, you, you can't be mad about it for too long it's it's a part of the game and and uh, yeah it's i think that's the sailors are a good sailor at least is good at at um at tackling these situations um the uh, the british olympic sailing team they have a, a phrase i'm sure many other people use oh, it as tell well. me they're quite good C control yeah. the controllables yes exactly so yeah. in other words only control that which you can control and all the other stuff that bothers you if you can't control it don't worry about it, because there's nothing you can do about it. Exactly, and that's uh, that's um, my point before, that yeah, sailors are getting more and more used to, to this, that you have to put it behind you and just fight on, and um, yeah. And from our commentary position, we can see that tanker. It is absolutely enormous, yeah. and we can see that tall ship that's still motoring <laughs> along, and yeah. uh, those are two massive windbreaks that these uh, teams are having to try to sail around. And, um, well, in the case of the tanker, you wouldn't want to be anywhere near it. And we were all the time talking, yeah, here we have them all in the picture. <laughs> it looks trafficked, for sure, traffic jam. But, uh, but um, we were all the time talking about that there would have been, we expected it to be more winds outside the, uh, the little channel into Kiel. Um, but... Uh, I must say now they have actually less speed than inside the, the bay. We're more down in five point something in knots and uh, of knots of boat speed. So, and you can see more and more people are sitting to the leeward side of the boat here in the German team. So there's, there's actually less wind for the sailors right now. Yes, okay. So um, that's still going to create lots of opportunity for place changes. Uh, but uh, is it going to be enough for anyone to be able to get back at the fins? Bottom right of our picture with the graphics, 
The Finns absolutely running away with it right now, more than 300 meters back to the next boat, uh, but, but still very close between second and third, between the, uh, the Germans and the Russians. And, and actually, the, the Danes, it's not that long ago that they were fighting for second place. They're, I mean, they're still not out of it. They're still 150 meters back from second place. The, 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 the story we haven't been able to tell you is what exactly happened to the Swedes, because they were doing so well half an hour ago, and then in the space of five minutes, they just seemed mm. to drop off the map. I, I don't know if they had to make a, a big... Uh, maneuver or a, a course change for a tall ship or something else, but it seemed to go wrong for them quite quickly. Yeah, as we can hear in the background, we have some traffic, out, uh, traffic going on out there and, and some of the bigger boats not being super happy about small, what they would call dinghies, these 150s laying in the way for them, so so there's some tooting out there, but and I think uh, I think you're right, the Swedes probably had to avoid some, some boat there. Um, but the Finnish are looking so strong. Um, now a little bit of less speed, but but yeah, they are clearly in, in front. Uh. On board with the Danes. Wondering where the next opportunities might lie. In uh, in Britain, we have a we have a game. Um, no one else has ever heard of it. Snakes and ladders. Have you heard of it? Yes. Oh, you have heard of yes, it. Yes, I have. But yeah. I think we had a, a like a, a drill in sailing that was like this, right? Isn't that like this? Like um, a, our coach made it to a. Well, I'm not aware of it being a, a sort of a drill. It, okay. it's, it's basically just a, a, a board game where you, you you shake the dice and then you see how many moves forwards you make. And if you're lucky, you get to climb up a ladder. If you're unlucky, you, you shake the dice and uh, it's a five or a four or whatever. You have to move four or five places and then you end up sliding down a snake. Yes. That's sort of what it is. That's what it's like out there at the moment with all this traffic. So easy mm. to slide down a snake out there. But do you, you want to learn a Finnish expression now since they are in... Yes. I, I can't yeah, speak Finnish. Yeah, that would Finnish, be much more can, relevant. Yes, yeah. I, can, I, can, uh, I can't speak Finnish. Uh, but I, um, I know this word, sisu which means uh, it's like an old traditional Finnish word that means like fight, uh, fight to the end. And now we have the Russians here, but it was against some war many, many hundred years ago against the Russians. They invented this word and it means like just fight. And the, and the Finnish have taken this through their culture. And it's like when it's super dark in the winter, because they almost don't have light in the winter, um, they are like, they have this Sisu, you know, they are right. fighting for everything. So in the sports and everything, they have Sisu. It means like fight. Yeah. Okay, so I it's like a pretty, it. Sisu. It's, yeah, Sisu. It's quite a soft word. Yeah, but they, you know, the Finnish, they say it like this. Sisu. Okay. Like, something like this. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't, I'm sorry if, my, it sounds if we have any Finnish viewers out there. It. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but it's, it is like, um, and I think that uh, I was actually asking them yesterday, do you have a lot of Sisu on board? And they said, yes, yes, we do. Of course, <laughs> we're Finnish. So, uh, yeah, it is a Finnish thing. And, uh, yeah. and uh, you're going to be following the race um, all, all through the course of the next two weeks. Yes. It's a little bit shorter, the, the overall length of the race, than last year. So it's still the same distance, 1,000 miles. So, so where have they made up the, the time? Uh, here in Kiel, for example, last year they had more training and more uh, intro races. This year it's only uh, put down to one day of intro races, which is today. And then, um, and then less days of training as well. And then they will have... Uh, I think, like, uh, instead of going, for example, from Copenhagen in the morning, they will go the evening before all these. They have maybe taken a half day, uh, some of the stopovers, and in that way they've made it shorter. And I think it's, it was a request from the sailors. It was a very long race, and some of the sailors have regular jobs besides this, and for them to be able to, to take off from work and, and, and say to the family, I'm going to use all my summer holiday, and the Nordstrom race wasn't that popular. So I think that, uh, that they've shortened it down for, for, for that reason. Um, okay, well, it's still quite a long race, isn't it? Two weeks is still quite a long it time. It is, and uh, racing these thousand nautical miles from Kiel and then through all the stopovers to St. Petersburg is the biggest offshore race we have in, in the north of Europe. So, so yeah, it is, uh, it is a long race. And, uh, I, yeah, you experienced it last year as well. The sailors are very tired in the end in St. Petersburg. Yeah. For two weeks in a row, in a row they haven't slept uh, enough, um, 
they probably haven't eaten enough either. So they're very um, yeah, exhausted when they come to St. Petersburg. Happy and exhausted because they've had a great experience on the way, but it's been demanding, of course, and challenging. And when we arrived last year in St. Petersburg, it was in the middle of the, the Football World Cup as well. And yes, true. One of the semifinals was just a, about to take place in St. Petersburg. And there was a, a great sense of um, uh, internationalism there, wasn't yes, there? There yes. were so many tourists. Yeah, and, true. Um, and we discovered that you even need a visa to, to, <laughs> to get into Russia as well. We could go into that story a little bit yeah, later Yeah, Andy on. Has, uh, has a great story there about me. <laughs> you can use, yeah. No, I, I, had to, I had to sign in for a football visa there, visa in, in well, the we'll, last we'll minute. Come back. If we have time, we'll come back to that story a little bit later. But, but get, getting into to Russia, maybe this is why... Oh, hang on. What are you seeing? What the, are you seeing? The Danish, the Royal Danish Yacht Club with the Danish flag on, are on the last position Ouch. right now. It's, it's been a very, very expensive last couple of, I would say, t- maybe 10 minutes for the Danes. They've gone from ten, second to fifth. And, uh, yeah, super expensive. And another thing I think that's a little bit a tendency is that the Finnish are all the time lower in speed. Uh, right now they have uh, five point, yeah, five knots and the Germans have 6.3 and in general I think we see more five point something on the Finnish and and the and the Germans and the Russian we see more six point something so this could make it a little bit exciting for the first spot as well and we only have 150 meters uh, apart now and getting uh, no yeah it's it's at least the the Germans have caught in on 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 the Finnish team so yeah Changes are happening out there right now. The Finns seem to have managed to avoid the, the worst of the traffic out there. That We don't, haven't really seen them around any of the tool ships or the tanker. I, I don't know how much that's skill and how much that's luck, but things seem to be going their way. Um, but uh, now it's the Swedish who are in, in, at the back again. But, yeah, the Danes have really suffered in recent times, haven't they? Yes, they have. They have definitely been in some uh, traffic jam and were forced to tack in a place they didn't want it to. And here we actually can see a super good overview of of the winds where the Finnish sailors are now. There's not a lot of wind, but more to the right side of the picture, there's more wind. So um, it's it's definitely it's also a question. It's not only a question about the traffic. It's also a question about hitting the puffs and. Um, and getting them. That might be why the finish were slower. This puff we see in the back of the f- picture might have been the one that's like died out and um, and the finish are now up in the same speed as, as the ones behind them. So, yeah, as we talked about before, if you have the puff and it leaves you, the one in the back will still have it. They'll have the speed and then, yeah, it's, it's going up and down all the time. Well, things going nicely the way of the Finns. Let's find out a little bit more about them in the uh, video clip that we caught with the Finnish team. It was an absolutely amazing experience. Uh, we started off with the uh, with the Kilowoche, with the uh, course racing in in Kiel, and then then we went all the way from from Kiel to St. Petersburg. It was amazing. Uh, of course, it, that is, is a great honor. It, it's a great honor for the club to 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 win the Champions League and and get the possibility to to join the North Stream race and and then to to sail through the, the Scandinavian countries under the flag of Finland. That that's it, it's really cool. We we learned a lot last year and and uh, there there are are people on board that, that that was also there last year and we also so recruited some some really good offshore sailors from Finland to to take with us. So I, I think. They, they are, are better prepared than ever. I think it's a uh, uh, it, it's a fantastic event with, with what's happening in all the harbors with, with the, the import races. That there is a lot of spectators looking at this, and and, and when we sail the boats with, with the flags in the in the mainsails, and, and I think it's it's re- really uh, excellent way of, of, of joining the, the Baltic countries. Back on board with that 
same Finnish team. They've led from the start. They had a fantastic start um, some hour and a half ago uh, when they launched off the transit line at uh, Kiela Yacht Club just in downtown Kiel. And now almost 10 miles up the track, they're leading by 200 metres from the Russians, who we should remember are one of those two teams that were over early on the start. So that's a fantastic recovery by the Russians to, to be up in uh, second place. Um, we've also got a video of the, uh, the Russian team who were new to the Nord Stream race. It was the Russians who won last year, but it was a different set of Russians from a different sailing club. Let's find a little bit more about the Leviathan sailing team. <laughs> Are we proud? Yeah, sure, of course, because uh, we we really proud to be a part of a North Stream race because uh, uh, we won national uh, Russian national uh, sailing league and uh, it's a it's a big honor for us to represent Russia uh, in the North Stream race. Actually, it will be quite complicated for us this year because uh, Russian team won uh, in 2018 and um, we. Definitely, we will we we will try to to do our best to to repeat the the result of Russian team in 2018. That's that's our main goal. Yeah. So the Russians are feeling the pressure of uh, having to live up to the expectations of being the defending champions, e even though it's not the, this set of Russians that are defending the title. It's, it's just the feeling of, of needing to, to keep it going. And, and obviously the, the Russian involvement and connection in this race is, is strong. Uh, St. Petersburg Yacht Club uh, being the organizing yacht club of the Nord Stream race, and yes. it's where the race finishes. So. So many, many reasons for the Leviathan sailing team to want to maintain the, the uh, proud tradition of Russia winning this race after such a strong showing last year. Yeah, two Russian uh, main sponsors here at the Nord Stream race. It's Gazprom and the Nord Stream. So, I mean, it's, um, yeah, it is important for them to win this race. It gives them a lot of publicity in their own country. So, uh, yeah, I, I can understand why they have this pressure. And, yeah, it's, it's important for them. Um, now, the Germans, they've been uh, bouncing around the middle of this fleet today. They did really well in the inshore last year, not so well in the offshore. Um, they're showing signs of, of being good in the inshore again today. Let's find out some more about the German team. <laughs> I'm definitely proud to present my club and nation at the Nordstrom race, but I'm also looking forward to awesome races against other nations in the Baltic. So last year we were very happy with our inshore performance, but offshore we had some troubles. And we learned from those troubles and hopefully we will make not the same mistakes again and perform even better offshore. For me as an inshore sailor it was a completely different experience, especially the long trip from Copenhagen to Stockholm and all the way from Stockholm to Helsinki with tough weather and but also some close calls in between those boats, these big boats, so I'm looking forward to racing again. I'm definitely excited to sail offshore again. Our goal is uh, definitely to have the strong inshore performance and do even better offshore. Germans racing along on Port Tack at the moment. Looks like the traffic has eased up a bit, maybe more out into open water, fewer boats to navigate. From our commentary position here, it's busier than ever. You don't get the sense of that in, in this particular shot, but uh, uh, it looks like finally the Nord Stream fleet is breaking out into clearer water, and it's back to a five-boat race than, rather than a 1,000-boat race. 
Yeah, we have some uh, connecting Baltic through love there again in the back of the boat. We have one of our VIPs, uh, Gerhard Schröder, who is uh, there with his partner. And we didn't get a p kiss in this uh, picture, but uh, yeah, it, it definitely looks like a nice trip for him. Look at the different yes, angles there. Massive. I mean, the, the Germans closer to picture are in completely different breeze. To the, it must be the Russians uh, just further ahead of them. But you see now the oh, German there, boat. You get the header. Yeah. Yes. So as you say, it's a, it's a header, which means uh, the, uh, the, the wind direction has turned right. And I thought the Germans were going to lift out well in front of the Russians there for a moment. And they still look like they've got marginally better wind. But, but yeah, the, the, Russian ha the Russians have done a great, great job. And um, they really showed that even though you have a really bad start and starting off at the last one, it, it's about fighting until the end because, I mean, now they're on the second spot and only 50 meters away from the leading boat, Finland. That's the, that's the only one we have seen have been a threat so far for the finish. So uh, this is really good. Oh, it goes a little bit up and down there. I can see in the meters. But yeah, this is a great job from the, from the Russian sailors. Here we have the, the German team, two persons down to the leeward, trying to avoid any wind. It looks like a pretty easy life down there, doesn't it? Yeah, it looks pretty nice. Shorts on. They're on the sunny side. Everyone else is in the shade. Yes, and they're it... telling each other some jokes and yeah. It, it looks like a nice time down there. And of course, as, as uh, these two sailors, their responsibilities are um, bow and trimming. So uh, not specifically this uh, trimming, these sails that are up now. So, I mean, they are they're more like just adjusting the weight right now. And um, of course, they're part of the team. If they see something, they'll, they'll note. But it's mostly, uh, yeah, for them just to all the time be aware of, of the maneuvers and, and stuff like that. So they can actually talk a little bit about other stuff down there. <laughs> okay. Only 18 meters right now, says our graphics is, uh, or 30 right oh, now, hang, hang uh, between. On. Yeah, I mean, what, are those distances really real? Because that's a lot for Olanskas, Olanskas, Segel, Salskapet to worry about, if that really is the case. Yeah, We yeah. can't see them in shot, so I don't, I don't know where they are. No, I, yeah, it's going to be exciting when we maybe get them in the shot as well, but, but definitely the wind has dropped. Look at the water. It looks way more glassy now. And, uh, and also the, um, yeah, we have, we have more sailors sitting to the leeward of the boat. Uh, the, you can just see how the boat is moving through the water. There's less wind. So, uh, yeah, it, it looks really tough out there. And, and also before we saw a header, what was that maybe like, 20 degrees or more um, so it's uh, there's a lot of things to work with for the sailors out there right now so it does seem like the wind is dropping lighter the further out to sea they get the yeah. the breeze actually in here by our commentary position on shore is is quite good so the small boats are sailing in quite good breeze a, a mile or so further in shore but out to sea seems like the breeze is dropping out a couple of sailors moving higher up to the other side of the boat, so that suggests that a gust has just come in and they've got a little bit more wind now. And here we see, I think, some beautiful pictures of uh, the two trimming um, positions. Right now we have the guy uh, with his hat on who was trimming the front sail, and the other, we had another guy sitting there in front of the, the helmsman who was actually, oh, we have some more <laughs> hugging. I really like that they... <laughs> That yeah, they, we, we they, don't normally get to see that kind of thing no. until after nine o'clock in the evening no, on, exactly. on British TV. So I, f I feel quite fortunate. <laughs> yeah, and I think the camera guy must feel the same because he is really like enjoying <laughs> getting that picture. So uh, no, it's it's great to see that uh, that it is um, yeah that that it's so like this is what we call champagne sailing. Like it's the best conditions. It's sunny. It's a little bit middle light wind, um, warm. I mean. Yeah, they only needed champagne there on the back of the boat as these two <laughs> VIPs. It would have been champagne sailing. So uh, I, I'm happy to see that they are enjoying these um, Nord Stream inshore races. Well, the, the power of love seems to be doing wonders for yes. the Germans. I mean, they, they are certainly moving further up and uh, starting to, to threaten the Finns. Maybe there, there needs to be a little bit more of that loving feeling on the Finnish boat right now. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and I'm like right now with the graphics, I must say I'm quite excited to see when they approach the finish line because if you see the Danes all the right, uh, all the to the right bottom of the of the, they're almost in a straight line. The Danes, the Finnish, the Germans, and the Russian. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and to the left, uh, yes, corner to uh, to the bottom of yeah. So it's going to be exciting because I, maybe it it looks as if the Danes are actually yeah going to be able to be in the battle of, of these leading boats. Well, they've got massive leverage, so that means that being so separated from the rest of the fleet it could go really well or really badly for them at the moment. Um, the leverage is coming in the uh, the Danes' favour. They, they, they show signs of being able to get up into the, the, the top two or three again. And, and suddenly we see the Danes up into into second and now they're back down to fourth and i i think that's an indication that the um, uh, the graphics will all the time adjust to the course and it i think it will actually um it's an indication that that we will have a quite close finish here between the finish and the lead still but the germans and the russians and the danes are actually going to have a battle um so it will be exciting actually woo -woo. Uh, no and, and the swedes are are yeah not that far uh, behind and they had some moments before of glory where Sandra Sanquist, their tactician, made some super good calls. So maybe they look as if they're far behind now, but one or two good calls the next uh, half an hour to an hour until they're in the finish line will actually maybe um, help them uh, and, and get them forward in their position as well. So the Finns managing to hold on to this lead by the skin of their teeth, but occasionally you see the Germans looking like they might be getting up into the lead. And as we've just been talking about, this, this broad separation between the front four boats means that uh, depending on how the wind swings, it could really move in the favor of uh, Russians at the top of the picture or the Danes on the far left-hand side of the course. Okay, so the Danes are on port tack, so they'll be closing up with the rest of the field further over to the right-hand side. And uh, we can normally tell how things are going by how much the uh, the Duracell bunnies are bouncing around <laughs> on deck. And yes. There's slight animation there. It's not, it's not huge amounts of animation yet. But these, uh, you can actually see the other Nord Stream race boats in the like in the horizon there, the, the, the big boats. And I think for the Danish perspective, it looks pretty good right now. Um, they How have do you wind. How that? I, I, that's incredible vision. <laughs> yeah, well, let's that? see when they meet. No, but it looks as if they have a lot of wind and they're actually like, I would say they're, as we can see here on the graphics, they're on a straight line. And I don't know where they're heading exactly compared to the graphics we're watching now. But if the, if the, Finish line is not too much to the right of the side now. They will definitely be battling about the the one of the first spots here. And you can see them here. Will that be good judgment or good luck if the Danes managed to? I don't know. They tried something different. They had a uh, some. It looked as if they had to tack because of some some other big uh, industrial boats and and tall ships and etc. So I think they they were forced to think out of the box here and That's maybe it turned feeling. out. Yeah. 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 So. Look at, at these two, uh, I, I really love that about the Swan 50s here, that they have these sports that the skippers can... Oh, now we have a red jacket in the camera. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, there he's moving again. Luckily, he's always moving. We can see TV the feet there. Today. The only thing we can see are the feet standing on this little board. So this is super nice when the boats are healing. They have this little board you can click up and you will actually st stand in a more... Like, um, more upright. Yeah, upright position for the skipper. So And also the floor in the... In the cockpit this year is a new. Uh, they have some kind of a rubber cover on the on the floor, so they will be able to not slide so much. Ah, right. So yeah, they're really fan of it, the sailors. So okay. yeah, some internal details there. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be very exciting. Uh, the the Finnish are still ahead here, but look, we can almost see them on this straight line as the graphics showed showed as well. I think it's it's actually going to be exciting to see who will win this race i think nothing is given right now it looks really light doesn't it yes it does the as finished well. boat looks really soft at the moment more and more people to the leeward side that boat top of picture whoever that is they look like they're a little bit more breeze there yeah i think it was the germans or the russians who was out there and so germans and russians at the top of the picture yeah and the boat coming towards the fins <laughs> now that would be the russians i think they they look at 
a little bit more heeled over. It looks like they've got a bit more breeze as they approach the fins. And the fins, I think, are looking quite vulnerable here. They're looking a little bit dead in the water. Not much they can do about it. No, they don't look so happy either, do they? Again, body language, uh, Andy, that's what we got to work with. But, uh, but look, they we got can Sisu. Yes, they got Sisu, but they still, you can see uh, trimming. Uh, they're definitely not happy about this, their speed right now. One guy standing fully up and, and, and trimming there in the, in the middle of the cockpit. Um, yeah, it, it looks as if they, they're not quite satisfied. And they're in the back of the boat, the guys who will take all the have made all the decisions and will keep on taking them. They are, they are also um, having their necks turned 180 degrees all the time. So Yes. So it, it certainly has closed up. They've been so comfortable for so long in this race. But now in the second half of this race, as they get closer towards that finish line at the lighthouse, um, they by no means certain of, of being able to hold on to the race. Uh, it's, it, it would be almost horrible to watch uh, Finland having been this beautifully in the lead the whole race and then having to give it up here the last uh, meters. I, it would be unbearable to watch, but that's the, the part of the game. And, and right now the, uh, the other teams are giving them a, a battle on that win, that's for sure. I'm, I'm looking forward. You said it before, Andy, with this boat more in the top of the picture, more to the right of the course. Uh, they have more wind out there, and it looks as if they have tacked to... I'm actually... We're on collision course, aren't we? So uh, now is the, the moment of truth. Will the Germans at the top of the screen actually be able to get past the fins? And it's a little bit deceptive from this camera angle. I think maybe the fins are, are faster than they appear to be. Yes, and um, also I think they're a little bit bow forward here, but a little header for the finish would uh, would make them uh, meet the, the Germans for sure, yeah. So you still have the fins as, as yes. reasonably comfortable in front, and, and the, the numbers on the screen seem to confirm that. Yeah, but you can see they're nervous. Look at them. He, they have one guy sitting down there in Leeward looking at, at, at the boat all the time, the, that German boat, and... Uh, the, he's almost biting his lips, isn't it? So they they have a little bit of a lift, and ah, there we see, yeah. So uh, the, the the guy at the back of the Finnish boat is a former 49er sailor, sailor Petri Kato. Um, so uh, very familiar with this uh, style of um, fast, apparent wind sailing. And probably did some racing down here in at the Kila Woche, who is um, yeah true. where we've had all years the many past years. It's actually been a World Cup a few years ago, um, where there are a lot of 49er sailors and other Olympic classes taking part every year. So yeah, it's uh, he's probably done a lot of hours here outside Schilksee in Kiel. And the 49ers and those Olympic classes will be starting in a few days from now for this edition of Kiel of Ocker, including the reigning Olympic champions from New Zealand, Pete Burling and Blair Chuk. So uh, some of the big names rolling into Kiel over the next week or so. And uh, an attacking move, what, a defensive, aggressive move by the Finns, attacking right on the face of the Germans looking to put some bad air back on the Germans. You know, I, I'm so happy, Andy, I must say. This is amazing. Like, look at this. I'm, an, I'm an, an old match racing sailor, and I just love this. Like, even though it's big boats and it's a long race, they're giving the Germans some bad air. And that's just, that's just genius. I really love it. Look, we can see here the two boats in line. The Germans are having to tack. This is match racing, even yeah. though it's uh, almost offshore racing. I think it's, it's all terribly aggressive. Yeah, I liked it. <laughs> I liked it a lot. And I think it was a very... If the left side is a better side to be at for the for the Finnish sailors, it was a very good call to to give the, the Germans uh, a little tack there on the head. Yes, yeah, certainly not wanting to tack where they were. So that's an extra maneuver they've had to do. But uh, the skipper of this boat, uh, the German, uh, what is he called, Sven Erik um, Horsch, he is also a former match racing sailor, so he's used to this, and he responded perfectly well. He took the, how do you say, yeah, the that little tack in his face super well. <laughs> he just uh, tacked uh, right away, and the whole team was just super fast in, into the next uh, tack. So that was... 
beautifully <laughs> responded by by the Germans. But I, uh, the the graphics could show that right now that the Germans have actually lost a little bit. The Danish are up now in 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 third spot. Yes, well, it does seem like it takes a while for the numbers to settle down. So we'll, we'll see if that's really the case. Ooh, Just but look here how light it is. We have, or maybe they're actually, yeah, it, it's very light. Did you see those pictures, Andrew? Yeah. We have so many people to Leeward compared to four, before we had way more uh, people with their legs over the side and now more people to Leeward. Uh, it is it's dropping out there. And, and there's still so much distance between the uh, the boats at the top of picture now, the Danes and the Swedes, compared with the three at the bottom of picture. And and the Danes, they got so much leverage on the far side. The, the, the numbers are bouncing around all over the place. One moment it looks like the Danes are going to be leading, then they look like they're going to be fourth. Um, so what have we got going on here? We've got Russia crossing Germany. So... Uh, Expensive here. The last couple of yeah. like just ten minutes or something. I think uh, the 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 Germans were almost looking as if they could actually battle for the lead. And right now they are actually in third spot. Uh, the the Russians just crossed them, and the Finnish are happily going on it. Yeah, I think their call for going to a little bit more in the middle again is was a good call. So they pushed the Germans out there, uh, and I I don't know if the Russians have tacked on the on the Germans again. Looks like it's so uh, the Germans not getting a lot of love. There's a, there's a, lot, a lot of love on board the German boat, but not from anybody else. No, no. No, it's definitely not easy to be them right now. And uh, But actually, that's not such an aggressive move there by the Russians. They're, they're, it's sort of a loose cover, isn't it? I yes, mean, it is. But, but still, the bad air could appear. And especially if, like, a couple of degrees ahead, the Germans will feel the, the Russians. So... But maybe the Germans are like, okay, we just need to swallow it right now. Or, I, I from my angle right now, it looks as if it could hurt the the Germans if they just had a little bit of of uh, a header. But their their speed is okay, um, so maybe that's an indication that that they're actually hanging on there, as you said that the Russians had just covered them loosely. And it looks like the Russians might actually be in the lead right now. So considering that they were over early on the start, they had to go back round and restart from way back in last place. And now to find themselves moving up into the lead, that's quite a turnaround for Leviathan sailing team. And I think you can see a, a Russian team that is like lifting high there uh, compared to the finish more to the left side in the screen. They're low in wind and also having a header compared to the Russians. The Russians look super strong. Look, a lot of legs over the side here, boat healing and uh, making adjustments, like actually gearing in the direction of more wind, uh, changing the gears. So this looks really, really positive for the, for the Russian boat. Um, uh, it does look like there's a little bit more breeze on this side of the course. And, and, and you know, I felt a little bit sorry for the Germans there with this. Uh, or I, I loved it to see the match racing, but on the other hand, I felt sorry for the Germans. And this could be their way out of this. If there's more wind to the right side and a little bit of a lift for them, this could be their hope to actually get into the battle of, of the wind for them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, nervous moments. Uh, it, it's psychologically difficult for the Finns having led and, and yes. they must feel like they've done everything right. And the, the, now it's, it's partly down to the luck of the draw, isn't it? And the luck is going against them a little bit. And also the fact that, uh, as we talked about before, being the leading boat and having to like cover the ones behind you, but still make your own decisions. This is the toughest thing to do. And uh, and they like the the boats were splitting. We saw the Danes are still not in the picture here, together with the Swedish. They're somewhere else, and the Finnish had to be somewhere, like not battling at all. And this is risk management, also one of the the things that uh, that we uh, if we make a parallel to the business world, it's a very important thing for sailing as well, uh, managing these uh, possible risks and and keeping your opponents behind you. So, I think actually the Finnish have done everything they could, but it might. Uh, yeah, it might cost them a first spot. 
The Germans look like they've lifted out on the Russians. Um, so the Germans, from being th threatened to fall into the bad air of Russia, it seems like the, the further over to the right-hand side you are, the better the breeze that you find. So I wonder if this is a chance for the Germans to move back into the lead. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and there was definitely, before in the picture, we saw some more wind coming up. And this is some focused German sailors. They know they have a chance. Um, and they were... Again, thinking about their aerodynamics and, and everything. But I think in the top of the screen, it looks as if there's a little bit more wind coming down. But it is light breeze. And a lot of traffic still. All these sails are creating some turbulence in the wind. And if it is the Finnish boat we have there all the way to the left in the screen between yeah. some other boats, then yes. they have I... definitely have more of the bad air from the other boat. So, yeah, the Germans are definitely a little bit more free air. And... Um, and, and they're about half a knot faster than the Finns as well. Yes, exactly. I think that is also their wind. They're a little bit higher in the... Like, they have a little bit of higher course as well. Yeah, I mean, what, one of the things I've noticed, you, you can see it in this picture now, the German boat has its boom pulled so far up to windward. They, they've really got the um, twist. the sail cranked yeah. up to the top. But, uh, yeah, maybe a, a lot of twist at the top. Is, so we're talking about the uh, the twist of the, the back of the mainsail. This so, is the pictures we are having now, actually, up there. And this is what you create. If you take the boom up and crank it up, they, you will have it open. In, and this is um, super good in the light winds to create this, this twist. And uh, yeah, maybe this is the reason, Andy, that they're actually uh, that they're actually trimming the boat a little bit better than the rest of the fleet as well. Well, they've really lifted out on those Russians from being almost on the same line as the Russians. They, they've look, you can see from the graphic there, they're on a completely different um, uh, course to the Russian or uh, line to the Russians now, having been dead behind the Russians. So they, they've definitely finding some height from somewhere, either either from better breeze or from better trim of the sail. But the Danes have now crossed behind the other boats. So now the, finally the Danes have traded in on all, all that leverage. They wanted to check in with the rest of the fleet. And, and they're in touch, aren't they? I mean, the They are in touch, actually. And um, they're definitely going to go behind the Germans. Uh, but it, they're, as you said, there's a little link to, to the top three for them right now. And, and I, as I said, I know these two Duracell rabbits and they, they are... Definitely gonna gonna go for for a better spot than they have now. So uh, you can see that line of white boats at the right hand side of the picture, and there's a red mark. There's a red rounding mark. Well, that's what these are. Um, Club Swan 50s are aiming for as well. So we're reaching a pinch point in the course. So the Danes and the Germans on the left of the picture are going to be on the ley line soon, and they're going to have to taxi. But is this German boat going to cross this other boat? It's just about got away with it, but the Germans have to remember that even the other boats not in their yes. race still have to be avoided when they're on port tack. And Finland on the far side um, is coming in on the port ley line. Looks like they're on about 5 degrees, 10 degrees higher track than the Germans and the Danes. So maybe things are coming back for the Finns just in time. The Germans now feel that they're on the ley line and they tack. The Danes will follow Ooh, they course. They have a huge... That's the, the wind that the Finnish had that you just said there, Andy. That's the header they got. They got a huge... Uh, Do you think the Germans aren't going to make it in one? Do you think they've um, tacked too soon? I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, the Danish are tacking there and they are having a little bit more marginal there. And we've got four boats very much in this race right now. The only ones that haven't got a look in and the ones we can't see are the Swedes. The other four teams are all still very much in with the shout of winning this race. Uh, this is going to be so exciting because the Germans are on a squeezed ley line, I would say. And, uh, and I think if this is the finish, we have just come. That's where the mark is. I think we're going to see a tech from their side in a little... Yes, well, absolutely. They're going to tack they right there, and they've just managed to get round before another starb attacker from another race uh, forced them to go round. So the but, Finns just getting away with it. And the Germans look as if they will survive there. They they got a little bit of a lift again, and more a little bit more breeze. So they they actually did a really good ley line job because the Danes, as you see, uh, a little bit behind them, they then went a little bit over the ley line now. Um, so great, great job from from the German team. Will and the Russians be able to get around in front of the Danes? It's looking close for the Russians. And they, yes, they think they've managed to get away with it. 
So this is a clear top three for us right now. We got the Finns around on the first spot. The second spot is for Germany right now and the third spot uh, Russia. But Denmark coming here with great, great speed from behind. And uh, wow, this is actually getting exciting. Imagine they started like, what, two hours ago um, uh, in, in, in Kiel. And now they're so close uh, in this little, little last beat until the finish line. This is going to be so exciting. The Danes still in very, very good speed, actually overtaking the Russians right now, as it looks like. Wow. So uh, will the Danes manage to maintain the momentum and roll over the top of the Russians? Very close for, uh, for third and fourth place right now. But a difficult position for the Danes to be in because uh, they are to the windward. They don't have any, like they can't go higher. The, the Russians will probably try to squeeze them off right now. So again, some match racing going on. And uh, the Russians are the one in power here. They can just go a few degrees lower compared to the wind and then they will gain more speed. So this is the Danish who, oh, they, they are in trouble there, I would say. Um, now, it doesn't look like there's too many passing lanes right now. So uh, the Finns are back in the lead. They briefly lost the lead to Germany. Uh, but the Finns, who have led for 99% of the time of this race so far, uh, seem to be in quite a secure position at the moment. Yes, yes. Uh, this is uh, what you would call a normal transport <laughs> sailing. Like, there's not a lot of... Uh, like, as I understood, they just have to continue this course to the finish line. I'm not 100% sure, but there's not a lot to play with for the sailors. Um, so, yeah. I, th I think we see them from our commentary position, um, and uh, it looks like they would just have just this final starboard exactly. tack to do across to the finish, which is next to a large red and white lighthouse, which will probably come into view. Uh, so I'm, I'm hearing that uh, they, they have another turning mark before they get to the lighthouse. So there may be some more tactical options that come into play um, in, the, in the, uh, the, the next few minutes. But at the moment, this is a very easy race for the Finns to be able to defend because there aren't really any passing lanes right now. I think you called it a transport course. Yes, <laughs> that's what we call it normally. In the we Olympics. call it a soldier's course. I don't know uh -huh. why we call it a soldier's course, but that's... Transport makes more, way more sense, it does. doesn't it? Yeah. It does, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, but uh, normally, and also in some Olympic fleets, you have the same, like, it's you can't really pick, uh, you can't really, yeah, gain anything, lose anything. It's just about, we normally say, just everyone stay aboard, then we'll keep our position like this is, yeah. So, uh, yeah, a bit frustrating, isn't it, when you're behind? It's, it's quite nice when you're in Especially here for the front. Danes. They came with a lot of speed. If it would have been some more attacks, they might have put in attack there and, and try to fight for, for a better position. But right now, they don't have a chance. The, the Russians squeezed them off. As we see, they gained out of this and they are far ahead of the Danish now. So, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a bit frustrating, I think, as you said, Andy. And... Uh, the, uh, the camera rib just putting a bit of wake out in front of the Danish boat. Yeah, I, don't well. know if, I don't know if there's going to be any complaints <laughs> about that, but... No, but I also think that the sailors, they know it's a short time until the next uh, inshore races are coming up at 2 o'clock, and that's on my watch only in 50 minutes. So I think, to be quite honest, on this transport lane, they are more, like... Uh, thinking about maybe are oh, anyone needs a power bar or, or something to drink and stuff like that because they they know it's not there's not coming a lot of maneuvers now in the next couple of meters ahead of them so well, you now say, they can you say that but I just see that big container ship ah, cutting across the top true, and Andy. <laughs> obstacles just, love them <laughs> I just wonder if the next obstacle is just about to get in their way yeah well, and yeah. if it's going to affect anyone it's going to be the leaders. Um, because the leaders are going to reach that, the line of that container ship first. So is this another curveball that the Finns have to avoid if they're going to hang on to their race lead? <sighs> Exciting, Andy. Yeah. <laughs> Stay tuned out there. <laughs> well, you do not want to be messing with a no. boat of that size, do you? No, really, really not.
And uh, we've heard a lot of tooting out there uh, earlier on, so maybe we're, we're going to get some more sounds. I think it, it's the Saturday. I mean, wh why do they have to be moving commercial shipping around on a Saturday? I think you should ask someone from <laughs> Kiel about that. <laughs> <laughs> Not me, Andy. <laughs> should be a, it should be a five-day week. The weekend should be for having fun. For everyone. I, I, I agree. And they should just come here and, and like park their boats and uh, join the Kiel week. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of opportunity, as you said before. You can get a bratwurst, uh, you can get beers, you can get all kind of good food here in the Shilk Sea. There's a lot of things you can test and try and buy, and I don't know <laughs> everything. So yeah, there's a lot of events happening around here. The Danes here in the picture. We al we always see these two twins, right, with their blonde hair, doing a lot of things. They're also. everywhere all <laughs> the time, aren't they? Yes. There's actually more than two of them. I can't wait to see them in the next couple of races where it will be up and down. Oh, uh, yeah. They will be up and down on those up and down races, won't yes, they? Yes, yes. And, um, oh, here we have... Oh, this is, this is going to be a bit of a wind shadow, and, and you can already see some of the boats in the other fleets having to oh, change yeah, course. Oh, yeah, that one to the left, yeah. And yeah. this is going to really affect the leaders. This is an opportunity for the other boats behind to be able to attack, and there's really nothing that Finland can do about this. No, all the Germans are keeping high right now, as you see in in most f in the front of the picture. And the, here, the Finnish are actually having to dock this container ship. Oh my God, this is so sad to watch. I think. Oh, so ah. you know, uh, we're we're hearing that uh, maybe <laughs> Gerhard Schroeder has ordered the uh, commercial shipping ar around these German lanes uh, to to move in favour of the German boat. Um, oh, this is this is going <laughs> to cost. The finish. I'm I'm almost daring to say live that it's going to cost them the their lead. And the boat not, goes oh. up right now. You can see the finished boat. It's in bad air now. The germ the, the Germans, Germans just... are going to get bad air as well. I mean, it's not all going to the boat that's going to profit most from this is going to be the Danish boat. Ah, uh, and maybe the Russians if they're not too. Uh... Oh the, yeah, the, the, the Germans are a little bit hurt of this. Gonna, or there will be as well, but the finish looks so slow and oh, this well, it's not going to last forever. I mean, no, that depends they'll... on where the mark in the front is as well. Yes, but that's that's definitely given the Germans an opportunity to attack. And what here about we have the, others? the Russians? Here we have the Russians at the top. The Germans have a little situation there with a little other white boat who didn't really have enough wind. There, I think the Germans were thinking, should we take it to leeward or windward? Mm -mm -mm, they took it to windward. So the, the Russians, they're in the bad air of the, uh, of the container ship now. Yeah. Of the, and, and, and so they're slowing down a little bit. And now the Danes, so the Danes, Danes are always, also going into the soft area, but being the furthest back of these four, probably being least affected by it. And meanwhile, we haven't had much to say about Sweden lately. We haven't seen them for a no, long, long time. No, they're so. not really in this battle for, for the win. And maybe the Danes are not either, but they're still adjusting everything and, and taking this race super serious. Uh, you can see their focus. And look at the, the uh, speed difference. So, so the Finns were back up to nine knots yes. of boat speed and, and the, the other boats were down at about five knots. So, so the Danes, even though they, the container ship is quite long past now, it was a, a minute ago, uh, the Danes are still having to go through that bad patch. So that, that was being, that's been quite a significant effect. Here we see that the Finnish are still a lot in the lead, but they just lost some, some height uh, compared to the others. And the question is where the mark is in front of them compared to this, if they actually have to put in another tack yes. at the finish or if they can survive there. Um, this will be, the, this will be the, the question for the Finnish because if they have to put in a tack, I'm not sure they will um, cross the, the Russians, for example. And then maybe not also the Germans. So it's it's going to be exciting here the the next couple of minutes. But the, the Finns seem to have consistently the highest boat speed at the moment. Yes. They're the only boat achieving over nine knots of boat speed. Yes, they. Um, here we have the the Russians in the picture. They don't really look that. Um, they look all quite high in the boat and as if they're I don't know what they're what they're doing, but. They're not looking as if they're having a transport race right now. They're looking <laughs> as if they're going to do a maneuver or something um, on that boat. But here we have them in the overall graphics. 
And the Danes have uh, dropped down to a lower angle than the Russians, so they were more on their line. But yeah, until we know where the next mark is, we, it, it's really hard to know what the options are for boats like the Germans and the Russians. Yeah, and I think uh, also we don't have a fully upwind course right now. I think they're probably also why we see this a little bit more speed, that they're a little bit between upwind and halfwind now in, in the course. Um, at least they are having better speed than, than before on the upwind. And Jenica going up on the Russian boat. Ah, so, so yes, it was right that they're a little bit more half wind now. And uh, ah, now we get that sail up that we talked about before, Andy. Right. Love well, it. you got it on board. You might as well use it. Yeah, exactly. What took I'm them so long? Exciting to see if they can actually keep that angle um, compared to the other boats who haven't put it up. But uh, maybe the Germans are like, why not? I mean, we want to try to to gain some boats. So. Not really come up yet. I think it's the Russians we have here in the in the picture. They're probably just preparing it. Okay, so yeah, not not actually bringing it into play quite yet. Yeah, and that's that's an, another very important job uh, for all the teams to think about which sails to use when. That's uh, a call that's very important and. Uh, and uh, also in the offshore races, it's all the time thinking about when should we change our sails. And um, sometimes you can be awakened up in the middle of the night like, oh, we... Ah, okay, so, we just yeah, got a call that... Yeah, so, so it's, it wasn't the Jenica, it's the, it's the stay sail. So you, you can see the, the, the small jib flapping in, in between um, the, uh, uh, the Genoa at the front and the mainsail at the back. So an, a, a little bit of extra sail area. Uh, but it's being rolled away again, and maybe they decided that wasn't such a good move after all. No, but I think it was wise of them to just give it a chance and see, like, it couldn't hurt. They were they are not quite stable third position, and, uh, and yeah, that's probably why Ooh. we saw them. Ooh, that's why. Oh, that's why. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you just got to keep your eye out oh, yeah. around here, don't you? That's maybe why they rolled it in then. <laughs> no, but, uh, yeah, they are definitely having some action, even though it's this transport race well it, it is a race against transport ships isn't it yeah, it's like it's, true. it's true. like a game of chicken it's yes. like the, the, yes. that video game where yes. you got to get the chicken across the road <laughs> yeah oh it that looks a little bit like that from from our perspective but uh, maybe they're making ready to roll it out again i think so actually that second jib up there or oh, are so they going like to take it's coming it down yeah, so okay. they're not bothering with it after all no no, but I think it was a wise decision uh, to, to try and see if they could actually gain some speed. They concluded, no, we can't, and then they are, they're taking it down. And also just to play a little bit with the sails. Again, it's the transport race uh, course right now to the finish line, and, uh, and for them it's just uh, about testing. They have two weeks of sailing ahead of them, so now they know the limit of this, this sail. And, uh, yeah, so I like, I like that they tested it at least. Maybe. Day sails seem to have become fashionable over the last uh, two or three years in sailing. Yeah, I haven't really raced with them myself, but uh, it is uh, giving you an advantage if the wind is not fully upwind. And, and uh, in these offshore races or like other um, longer inshore races, you can, you can definitely have um, advantage of them. Uh, look at the gaps now. It's, it's 400 meters back from the leader back to the Danes. So you think how close the Danes were at that last yeah. turning mark. Yeah, yeah. And now the transport course, this is the problem with the <laughs> transport course, is that um, the rich get richer and uh, the further back you are, the, the worse it gets because you, you just don't have any passing lanes. No, true. And, and in the Olympic fleet, you have this little transport race, for example, in, in, the, in my husband's fleet in the Finn class, you have this little transport fleet to kind of like get them into the finish line and not like in one chaos. They come like like pearls on a string, like here. And uh, that's easier to get them into the finish line like that. And, um, but, uh, yeah, oh, what do we have going on there now? So it, look, the it looks like the leader has rounded that yellow mark. You can see another boat from another fleet rounding the yellow mark. So um, they are turning this mark, leaving it uh, to starboard, to their right-hand side. Um, but until we know where the direction is of the mark after that, we don't really know if there are any attacking lanes. But it, it looks, if anything, like it's going to be an even easier race for 
Finland to defend based on the direction that it's heading at the moment? Yes, and they are actually... Um uh, this is also why they have these iPads that we talked about before. Um, it's uh, to they have all their navigation, their courses they have plugged into the to a navigation app uh, so that they know where to to go. As we are talking now, oh, where's the next mark? They are not in doubt at all. They they have everything under control and the boat, and um, and yeah, their tactician is taking this into consideration about where the wind is coming from and where they have to go to the next mark. So we have the Russians here in the picture. So same positions since the last mark, even though we had some action with some tank, tank boats, what do you say? Yeah, tank, uh, con yeah. container boats. Yeah, uh, container ships, yeah. <laughs> there wasn't um, any changes in the leading board right now. As I understood it right, I think this is the last uh, beat into the finish line, right, Andy? Do I'm you know? not entirely sure, but I, I think looking at where they are out there, I don't think they've got too much further to go. Uh, I'm quite sure this is the last beat towards the finish line. And and these other boats there on the, the Arl race, the race round the corner beyond the finish line for the Nord Stream fleet. Uh, the, the smaller boats are racing towards the village of Eckenforda where they will, they will be rewarded with that prize of an Arl or an eel as yes. we call it. <laughs> Uh, a snake-like fish. Um, I, I've never actually dared eat eel. I just can't bring myself to do it. Have you ever actually had eel? Um, no. And uh, I, I think the whole thought of it is not really me. And then smoked on the top of that. No, thank you. I think... Uh, no, but we should give it a go maybe later on, you and me here. As long as it's got ketchup and mustard on it. Yeah, we could survive probably. Yeah. yeah. So quite big gaps now. Um, 150 metres back to second place, Germany, then 350 metres from the leader back to Russia. And then the Danes. Yeah, well, and it looks, I'm a little bit in doubt now what's going to happen because it looks as if the Danes and the Russians were going way more high than uh, the Germans and the Finnish. So maybe there's a little bit to play with or the Danes are hoping to get catch some better air up there but right now it looks as if the Finnish and the Germans will get this breeze as we see in the top right corner down to their boats in a couple of seconds it looks a bit soft for the Finns there in middle of our screen not a lot of breeze for them right now no true but I think it will come if we see a little bit more up to the right in the screen or the top I think actually that that it will hit them soon uh, it looks light. Yeah, you're right. And yeah, I've, it's it's difficult. It's even difficult for us to, to watch, even though we're having a, <laughs> you know, helicopter perspective and all this, watching on a screen. It's so easy to be clever here, but um, they, they are really having a hard time out there. It's not easy uh, taking these decisions. They're having a boat speed of 6.19 right now, yeah? Yeah. And the other ones are having approximately the same. Around. Yeah, so. yeah, all around six knots or so. So not massive speed differences between the boats right now. No. Nor Deutsche Regatta Fahrrein, generally the lowest speed. But I, I wonder if they're doing that trick with the mainsail, looking for, for more angle, for higher angle towards the wind and happy to trade for less boat speed. And the Danish up on a third spot right now. Again, it depends on where the finish line is because they went very high after that yellow mark. Um, so it might be that the traffic or uh, the, the graphics are, yeah, I mean, are it's, teasing uh, us a little bit. But yeah, I think we're, we're seeing uh, some glitches in the system there. I think it's the Russians still in third. Yes. Oh, now, yes. I think it's because the the mark rounding is... Um, that's, that's, that's right. Once the... Maybe the Swedes aren't fully on to the new course yet. Yeah, but definitely no doubt that these guys are in the lead. Uh, they're looking behind them to, to see the other boats right now. And, uh, yeah, we're having some uh, super good sailors here on board. A lot of world champions and European champions. And, um, yeah, the, the helmsman of, of the Finnish boat who's called Miku Tillika, I think I pronounced that right. <laughs> he is, um, it's his first time at the Nord Stream race, but he sound, sounded very um, hopeful and, uh, and yeah, he has some of his crew is 
joined the last la, uh, joined the Nordstrom race last year, and then he has all these experienced sailors. And he said the dynamics of having both young and a little bit more experienced sailors on board really was a good thing for them. So they're also gonna the Danes and the Finnish are gonna be the two teams with a lot of uh, youth uh, dynamics on board. Okay. Meanwhile, it looks like Germany has tacked on support and is maybe trying to defend its second place against the other three. And, and the Danes have seem to have dropped way back, uh, as have the Russians. I, I don't know. It's, it seems like things are changing. Yes, it depends a lot about where this next mark is. Uh, if the if the case is if, if it's in a straight line of where the finish is now uh, uh, in their sailing direction, the Germans are still in the second spot. But since they tacked, it might be a little bit more up. So at some point, if we see a tack from Finland as well, we know that it's it's going to be open and the boats are pretty close to each other. It shows here on the graphics. So, well, I'm amazed that Finland aren't tacking to cover if, because yeah. I mean they are allowing separation to really build up between them and the rest of the fleet. So that they must really like this left-hand side of the course. Uh, but having seen the Germans tack, I'm really surprised that we haven't seen the Finns tack as well. I think you're right. And, and, uh, but the Finnish has been dealing with this uh, being in the lead all the time and uh, done really well. Uh, this risk management of keeping people behind and, but still going for what they see. And this is probably what they're doing now. They're believing in what they're seeing. And they look pretty good here. A lot of legs out of the the side of the boat and uh, according to our graphics they're still in the lead but if they have to take attack um, if they have to make attack it's it's going to be close with the Germans maybe they'll even go behind so the, the Germans have tapped back and they seem to have managed to protect their second place yes. on the rest of the fleet but the, from from this angle it looks like they, they don't have much of a chance of being able to get back to attack the Finns no um, Depending on the, if the fins have, if the mark is more like to uh, where the arrows are coming from the picture, more like up, um, or like yeah, so that the fins also have to take a uh, attack, then it will be close between the Germans and the Finnish. But um, so the Finland out on its own. On the right-hand side of the picture, Germany, the best of the rest at the bottom of the screen. And then uh, looks like the fight for third between Russia and Denmark quite close at the moment. And Sweden not fully out of it, but with a lot of work to do. Yes. Um, yeah. It's going to be exciting to see how it will... Uh be because it it depends a little bit on on where this mark is but but exciting is that the germans they have kind of like secured their second spot where where they are right now and uh, as you said it will probably cost them the fight for actually going for the win for the Finns. but um yeah right now as as um we just got a little picture here from our great people sitting behind the screens that um that they are almost heading towards the the finish line right now. Uh, the Finnish need to get a little tack in, and uh, yeah, it, there will be some action. Andy. So, so the, the Germans, they there wasn't much port tack to be done, and they did it early, which which doesn't leave them many tactical op options. But it does mean that they have managed to protect themselves on the boats behind. Uh, we can't see in picture, but the the Finns have actually tacked on to port tack now. Um, and uh, we see it there in the overall in the graphics here that they are making the tack right now and meeting the rest of the fleet. And that finish line not far away from the finish. The finish line is actually that white line that we see there in the picture uh, where the arrows are coming down as well. So this is uh, that little beat that they have to do and it looks as if actually all the other ones have to do a tack as well because they're underneath the ley line right now. So the fins are actually taking... They've it was a very good call from the finish, actually, even though it was maybe a little bit riskful to yeah, just stay true to their plan. And uh, right now they're sailing into what is our finish line of the Nord Stream race for the first off, uh, inshore race here in front of Kiel. 
Not, not long to go, not long to go. So there's a, an orange flag on top of a mark just next to the, just to the right of the, uh, the Finnish boat. And the Finns go into their final tack. And the Finnish have finished. Fantastic. Wow, they are so happy now. What a relief. It's been a race for two hours. They, they have been on the water since 8.30 this morning. So concentration up and everything, it's great. And look, the, even the VIPs are happy. They're like, yes, we did it. We and did our best. Yeah, look, <laughs> wave to the camera. What a great job uh, by this team. Um, Helmed by Miku Dillika from um, the Olandska Segelselskapet. And they, they had their hairy moments where they did briefly give up the lead, but in the end, quite a comfortable win for them. Yeah, they, they had a beautiful race, actually leading, I would say, 99% of the time. And uh, they, were, they were one of the three boats having a great start. They were not over the start line. So uh, that paid off well. And um, yeah, we are... Actually, I must, I must say they deserve to win this race, definitely. They, oh, yeah. They, they, yeah. they did. The, the times when they briefly lost the lead was really down to poor luck. They, they didn't really make a bad move, did they? No. Now it's more maybe the second spot that will be exciting for us. It looks as if the Germans can call themselves second, but um, the, Ger the Danish and the Russian are having some kind of... Yeah, they are also in the battle, but it looks as if the Germans can just cross the And you the can see line. that high boom again. I, I think their boom is unusually high compared with the other boats. So you can always... It, it, instantly recognizable, their boat, because the boom always looks like, to me, in the wrong place. It looks odd. Yeah. But it obviously works. Yeah, it is a, a trimming technique where you uh, twist the mainsail a lot in very light breeze, and um, they've had okay speed. Um, so, I mean... Well, good enough up. to get them across the line in second place, and it's going to be very, very close for third at the moment. Giving themselves a little high five there, and uh, super happy. And nice to see our VIP guest, Gerhard Schröder, is uh, also happy and high-fiving a part of the team here. Yes, a very, very close for third place, but it's going to be Russia across the line in third, just one boat length in oh. front of the Danes. Racing for two hours and then it's less than a boat length that uh, makes the difference here. It's uh, what a, yeah, I just love that. That they're so equal, these boats, they're so good, all these sailors. And uh, just shows that, um, yeah, you've got to be awake the whole time that one boat length can actually cost you a third spot. And, well, remember that uh, Russia was also over the line early, had to go back and restart. So a third place, very, very good for them and and almost up into the lead at points during that race. So good sailing by the Russians. Uh, Danes frustrated with a, a slightly poor start. And then they suffered some luck, uh, some bad luck in the middle of the race when they were bounced out to a side of the course that they didn't want to go because of all that shipping traffic. And that shipping traffic really did play yeah. its part in that race, didn't it? It did, uh, for sure. And um, they would have won... Uh, over the Russians now, if that uh, boat would have uh, made them tack and so on, so it is, it is important, and that's definitely what they need to to sail um, or say to themselves now that okay, we had a bad start, um, we uh, ha were having a little bit of unluck there on on that upwind, but um, of course we just need to to resettle. There's two more races coming up, and let's try to get the best out of that and pre be as prepared as possible and get to that start line because that that probably was the most expensive move from their side here in this race. So um, I wonder if they're going to stick to that, um, uh, to that schedule because it's 1.35 now and the, the next schedule start is 2 o'clock. So, so it's quite possible, but that's not time, much time for Chancellor Schroeder to um, have his sandwiches in between <laughs> the races, is it? No, they're going to have a change in the VIPs now. Um, okay. And then uh, I think they'll go get, get off the boats. And uh, actually it was said uh, that they yeah, would have the next start at two. So we are going to, yeah, we're going to see if they're going to have a little bit of a longer break. But uh, yeah, uh, at least it's going to be and another start soon. When the VIPs have gotten off and the sailors just got a little break, uh, then they will start off again. Okay, so the, the Swedes uh, 
disappointing start for them uh, to, to the regatta, having, having been over early on the start line. A lot of making up of lost ground to do, but not very long um, to wait to be able to redeem themselves with these two windward lured races coming up. And that's going to bring out a different set of skills, isn't it? We're going to see the manoeuvres tested. We're going to see those Janikas go up and down. We're going to see maybe staysails rolled out as we briefly did in yes. in the race just yes. now. It's going to be it's going to involve the the whole crew a lot lot more, isn't mm -hmm. it? It will, and it will be a lot of action. And I think actually now we have we've been talking about the Swedes, and they had a bad race here. Maybe they will actually uh, have some uh, gains here to do in the next two intro races because they have done more uh, Swan 50 sailing compared to the other some of the other countries. So uh, I think. Yeah, I hope for them that they can get some action and some maybe some good points in now in the next races. Well, let's just round you up with uh, the results of that welcome race, the welcome race of Kielavoka, where 300 boats are taking part. But the five that we've been interested in, well, there were two boats that, that got great starts off the line today. And funnily enough, in the end, it was those same two boats that have come first and second. Um, so Olanska Segel Salskapet led pretty much from start to finish, briefly attacked by uh, Norddeutsche Regatta Farein, who did take the lead for a, for a brief moment with uh, Chancellor Schroeder and his friend on, on the back of that boat. They were second. Um, and then Love spirit. <laughs> <laughs> the Russians were one of two teams that were over early on the start. So they did phenomenally well to, to come back and even threaten for the lead. They ended up in third place, Great. Leviathan sailing team. Yeah. The Danes, again, we, we saw moments of, of brilliance from them, except for that start. They had an awful start, which always, all, that put them on the back for, from the word go. And they, they, um, they, they had their moments, but they were always having to fight harder than maybe they needed to if they'd have got a better start. And then at the back, bringing up the rear, were the Swedes. They, they were over early on the start. Unlike Russia, they didn't seem to manage to get back into the race quite as effectively. But we've got about a 20-minute break. We're going to take a break. The sailors are going to take a break. We'll be back to you in about 20 minutes' time when we will pick up the action again for the two windward lured races this afternoon on Keel Bay. See ya. <laughs>